comrades to Utopian Cartography for another expedition into the unknown regions of the future to discover hope, real hope, beyond the illusions handed down to us by our previous generations that greed is good and war is inevitable because there will just never be enough to go around. As George Carlin said, it's all bullshit, folks. I mean, it's bad for you. I'm your host, Neon Felicity, and I'm here to tell you that we can have a positive future. Our guest on today's voyage is Anton Yorga. A uh, non-binary, non-profit, anarchist, mystic, poet, activist, teacher, uh, the legendary superconscious MC Kauki, Antony of Egypt, Kikwaku, Legion, and kind of my favorite artist of all time. He's a member of like a dozen revolutionary hip-hop collectives like Empty Handed Warriors, Sadhu Militia, Vimanis Project, Atlantis Army, Plague Monks, and bunch of others. He manages Revolt Motion Records, a revolutionary nonprofit hip hop label and hub of intersectional activist information. And he founded Mutant Academy, a visionary educational safe space for misfit youth. And he's currently working on his PhD at the University of Alberta Language and Cultural Studies program on diasporic activist futurist hip hop as the evolution of storytelling. He's inspired me so much. He's just an epic activist, academic, and revolutionary poet. Please check out his music after this interview. Um, it'll change your life. Because <laughs> he certainly changed mine. Uh, back in 2012, when I found him on an underground hip-hop blog, uh, you know, there's hundreds of rappers that I love, but he's on another level of being able to string together all these concepts from different mythological traditions and all just all around the world through history and it's just it, he breaks down so many illusory ideologies and you know dogmatic ideas about the, what, the way the world works that are just wrong so yeah in this conversation you're about to hear we talk about anarchism as a spiritual philosophy talk about the metaphysics of colonization and decolonization, we talk about theosophy and witchcraft as a synthesis of world wisdom traditions that have been suppressed by mainstream patriarchal religion. Uh, we talk about how the people at the margins of society are really the future of humanity. We talk about hip-hop as a radically inclusive global culture that integrates ancient shamanic practices and modern technology. We talk about animal activism and how vegan actually doesn't go far enough because it you know, doesn't preclude slave labor. And we talk about the differences between direct trade, fair trade, horizontal trade, and what, it, what something like ethical commerce would actually look like. And we talk about intersectional activism and queer theory. And we get his erudite take as a religious studies scholar on the true nature of this apocalypse that we're living through right now. And how the great shift is a cultural inversion where th things are reverting back to the way they were originally meant to be with um, paganism, matriarchy, animism, indigeneity, and how and why corruption naturally happens in hierarchical systems of power, and how the lifting of the veil has a dual meaning in a binary reality where the perpetuators of the abuse will experience a reckoning and the marginalized will experience a relief and empowerment. And we talk about the power of artistic activism in lifting the veil and accelerating our evolution. We talk about why the diversity of our differences are what creates the beauty in the world and why whitewashed patriarchal new age theology gets unity consciousness wrong. We talk about how s spiritual intuition gets calcified into dogmas over time and why religions are so different than the actual teachings of the prophets that inspired them. And we talk about the revolutionary power of sarcasm and satire to mock and disempower the system. We talk about science fiction as the new mythos for a technological future, and the complexity of the hero archetype, and how nobody's perfect, but in this time of great evil, we do need to aspire to be heroic. We talk about the importance of questioning everything. We talk about how sustainability and community are things that we need to cultivate, like a garden, and how empires crumble, and colonialism falls, and how we it doesn't have to come back if we study it well enough to break the cycle. And finally, we talk about how utopia is as beautiful as anybody can express it in art, and how it's really a mashup collage of all of our favorite art and experiences and transcendental realizations. And we talk about how deconstruction and decolonization is just the first step towards a better world. So thanks for joining us in this map-making endeavor to envision the path towards a world worth living in. So we're live. Welcome, comrades, to Utopian Cartography. I'm here with... Uh, one of my greatest teachers, one of my greatest inspirations, uh, revolutionary poet, activist, um, Anton Yorga. Uh, welcome to the show. 
<laughs> you know, that, that's a lot of praise, like I said, but it, it's all good. I, I really appreciate it. Like I said, I'm as much a teacher as a student, literally and metaphorically speaking. I think that's the only way that you could actually be that. And uh, it's, an, it's an eternal quest too. So, I mean, I think like like they say oftentimes, right, that the greater the, the praise on one side, the greater the so-called shadow on the other, which I don't think should be a negative connotation either. But I've done a lot of fucked up shit in my life and I've wasted a lot of my lifetime um, not just figuratively or, or, you know, perceptively, but, but doing a lot of dumb shit. So I feel like I had a lot to catch up and I was kind of manic the last few years trying to do that. Right. Yeah. I feel like, I mean, you've, ch I feel like you've channeled all your energy into really productive avenues. Like I feel like you've managed to channel all this creativity and this, you've been able to harness words in a way that and, and the, the, the reason that I do praise you is because I value the ability to ex, of expression. I, I think that that's part of one of the things our world is struggling with is that people don't know how to express themselves. And, and so that's, that's, that's why I took the name Felicity because it, means the, the the ability to find the uh, the appropriate expression for one's thoughts and i that's why i i love your work because it just i feel like you're just it's just like phrase after phrase of this like uh, of these things you know, that you know what's like, crazy? felicity in french literally the, the 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 transliteration of that is is a city which literally means um to congratulate someone right. so if like, it's amazing because the, the ability to properly express yourself, like you just said, is to be congratulatory. So, and again, most of the, like English language is like, you know, 50% borrowed from French, probably another 25, like, you know, meld of all kinds of other languages from Germanic, Anglo-Saxon to Arabic to like, you know, all kinds of other languages. So it's really interesting to see how many of those, and that's what I teach students too in translation and language classes when I do those is um, the idea to look at the transliteration, the historical context, and also the evolution of how say, for example, the French Academy in the, you know, um, in the 18th century actually completely changed the rules of French and a lot of the old French rules that were a lot more phonetic and a lot more oral based, and then started making all these weird exceptions and contradictions uh, that were completely opposite in many cases, which is why people are like, why are French people so backwards? Why is French so weird? And that the, the structure is different. And it didn't used to be like that. They used to be very similar. And it used to be much more accessible, just like English is, in a sense, to a lot of people, which is why a lot of people prefer to learn English as a second language than French, not just hegemonically, but, you know, otherwise. And that, a lot of people don't know, was a bunch of rich, white, you know, aristocratic men in, in Europe that actually, and then white in the context of, like, you know, a Western Eurocentric colonial, because I don't even believe in the concept of whiteness in the first place, other than, like, you know, white privilege exists, but the concept <laughs> of white is a... It's a, it's a voluntary association. If you choose to be white, like I claim white culture, I renounce my pagan roots and my origins before colonial settlement, then yes, you are white. But anybody saying you're white, I wouldn't call it racism, but it's a form of ignorance. It's a form of bigotry in a certain sense or misperception or mis, um, mislabeling because in that sense, if somebody is like, I don't identify as a white person, if they're saying I don't benefit from white privilege, that's that's an illusion, that's ignorance. But if they're saying I don't identify as a white person, regardless of the color of my skin or whatever I am, you know, uh, and Karis one and many other people have spoken about that that concept. Karis one even jokes about the fact he's like, you want to meet a real white supremacist because he's like a real white supremacist would be so polite to all the other cultures because he would realize that the only way there is a supremacy of whiteness in any kind of sense, and I'm paraphrasing, is that they would have to be extremely deferent to all of the cultures that created um, you know, the, the, the avenues and the foundations of everything that we stand upon to this day and how much other cultures have toiled for it. So he just flips everything around like a true trickster. And I, I really appreciate, like, in terms of, you know, uh, teachers, I like to say sometimes I'm a professor, even though I'm not really, you know, in that title, I'm technically speaking, I'm an instructor, but I don't instruct people. I'd right. rather like to say that I profess, even though it's not exactly prophecy. <laughs> and so to me, Karis one is the true original teacher. He's you know, the foundation of the gospel and, and the temple of hip-hop. So that was one of my biggest inspirations, like even back to when I was 10, 11 years old, back when I even listened to Snoop and Dre. I also listened to Jiru the Damager and Karis one And, you know, those were really, really fundamental. And Rage Against the Machine, Downset from uh, LA. There were really, you know, some hardcore and a lot of punk, a lot of, you know, old, old school punk, but a lot of new school punk, like 10 foot pole, satanic surfers, no use for a name, propaganda. A lot of those like revolutionary ideals came from that back then in the anarchist ideals. And, uh, and uh, you know, of course, other shit too, like, like the, the misfits and sex pistols and other like older shit uh, once in a while. But, um, 
yeah, so, so I, I've come from like a lot of hodgepodge of, of different stuff. And like I, like I was saying earlier too, when you kind of cut off, my mom being who she was too, she was an opera singer when she was a kid. So she would sing, you know, she sang in the orchestra of Quebec. And that's why I ended up playing piano because she wanted me to do that. So that was my classical basis. We would listen to classical music. I'd play classical music all the time. So, you know, from, from Mozart to Schumann to Chopin to jazz, you know, all kinds of other stuff. Um, I listened to all of that and world music and, you know, uh, yeah, my dad, like, you know, raised me on a bunch of different traditions from, I, I had books. I still have those books sitting upstairs at the academy here, like in Nikita uh, Teguac uh, in, in the Eastern townships where I have all of my childhood books there that she kept for like decades where, you know, I had like a book on indigenous myths, another one on Japanese myths, another one on Greek myths, uh, African myths. So I grew up reading all those different stories. So I didn't, you know, when they say the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, that, that's basically one of the main reasons I became who I was, was my mother and my father, and my father being a shamanic, like, gypsy um, who grew up in, in, in the Arctic and, you know, hunted and, and prayed and, and studied with, uh, with Inuit peoples. And my mom, you know, grew, grew up as an intersectional Métis, like I was saying, and, and uh, you know, a mix of culture as well. But yeah, just, just like I was saying, basically my mom was, you know, raised me for 95% of, of, of what I am now. My dad was kind of like that, you know, he disappeared when I was five and went back to the Arctic community where he grew up in, I believe, outside of Inuvik, uh, completely off-grid, like traceless, faked his death, you know, like uh, drove his pickup into a pond, like a canceled plane ticket to Europe, couldn't find a body, couldn't find any traces, wallet, everything was gone. Um, and just made a phone call to my mom right before he left and said, don't try to find me. I'm disappearing. Nobody's going to, you know, know where I am. And, uh, and all I had after that was like a box, like a trunk full of stuff that my dad left me that had like 200 US dollars with a bunch of random, you know, items, some of which I still have here, like some uh, old, like, you know, it hunted whale bones from like a century ago, uh, like a couple different parkas. Uh, that like Inuit Park is that were made, one of which I still have actually sitting here, just the inside. So this one had like a, a wolverine fur that my, my dad actually hunted with a spear in the Arctic, like back in those days. Um, but I, I actually stitched it off a while ago and uh, um, like probably like 15 years ago and I donated it to, uh, I put it on a, a winter coat and I donated it to a nonprofit thrift store at that time for somebody else to actually benefit from that. So it's been kind of a, a pet peeve of me to like try to detach as much as possible from whatever had the most symbolic value when people are like they're used to usually oh i donate to charity like yeah i have these old things i don't really want anymore um or like this thing's got a stain or this one i don't really like that shirt i've tried to do the opposite uh, obviously in some cases you know like something like like this teacher it might take me a while to donate because it's like anonymous for the voiceless right so i'm like if i meet somebody that's like yo I love animal activism. I respect all sentient beings. And like, I really love your shirt. I'd like to have that. I will probably assume that some other shirt will come to me in that sense. Right. But, uh, <laughs> and I've taken the shirt off my back, literally, even when I had no shirt and given it to somebody who was like, here, um, not, not as an exercise or whatever, but I was like, no, that's cool. You can appreciate right. this more than I can. I don't, I don't need this. But still, I, I like to do the opposite because it's easy to give something you don't appreciate or something you've already used or it's harder sometimes to let go of what really symbolically means a lot to you. Right. Totally. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a great point. That's another thing that, I've, that I love about anarchists in general. I feel like the, 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 the lack of attachment to things and consumerism it allows the, the general flow of goods in a way that, I mean, because... This whole system is based on private property. Everything about the system is based on ownership of everything. And so the, and we're, we're trained from a young age to think that, you know, you approach the world in terms of what you can get and then you hold on to it. And so I, I think that's one of the most beautiful things about, I guess, just like spiritual awakening is that non-attachment. And, and I feel like it helps the dissolving a lot of a lot of the illegitimate hierarchies that are you know at their base level you know based in private property and um and attachment and and ownership and and that's how all the abuse and exploitation happens because we're we have this whole entire paradigm like and i know you talk a lot about colonial languages like and my conception of the way that happened is that it, so i guess maybe that, that you'd be a good person to ask this question do other languages, uh, you know, like indigenous languages, especially, um, have this a, 
a similar syn syntactical structure of a noun and a verb where every sentence is a subject doing something to an object because I, I I've con I've conceptualized that as like as a problem with English but I don't know how pervasive that is in language language in general so I feel like you'd <laughs> as a that's a very good language and cultural I studies scholar I can't answer it like partially from a layman's perspective but um, you know, which is also a, a patriarchal <laughs> structure of a word, but <laughs> or lay person's perspective. Um, <laughs> but um, I, sadly enough, I don't speak any of my original indigenous languages. I don't speak, you know, on my mom's side, I barely even know a couple of words of Cree and Mohawk, and, and I know practically no Mi'kmaq, even though I'm going back to those those lands. I don't speak Michif because nobody ever taught me that. So I only speak colonial languages. My dad didn't teach me teach me Nuktatuk either. So, because he left when I was too early, even though that, that was his second language, literally he grew up in like, you know, his whole childhood and, and teenage years and early adulthood with that. So, um, but from the little that I know, what you said is like, you know, it hits the nail on the head in a sense, because it is very much a problem as much as, it, and this isn't for me, you know, in general, a lot of different linguists, a lot of uh, indigenous activists and people have spoken about the fact that uh, the concept uh, of oppression, for example, the concept of rape, the concept of torture, as much as some people argue that these, uh, you know, first of all, nobody even has a picture. It's not like we have a time machine to go back and be like, oh, ha, ha, this indigenous culture was raping this group. Of course there were wars. Of course there were aspects of abuse. And But but even the concept of that word and trying to translate that into the reality, what it represented back then versus what we consider to be abuse or rape now, they're completely fundamentally detached principles. Hmm. There may have been some distant correlations between the two, but I would even argue at that point that to me, that would have been like almost a pre-colonial patriarchal corruption as much as like say the intrinsic idea that something can get rotten already exists in, in a fruit before the fruit is even at that point of decomposition. So if you go back and try to decolonize in a sense colonialism before it even existed, it's very possible that the forces that came, just like for example, you know, um, yeah, this I think this is the best way I can put it. In a, in a better, like a more direct analogy that people might be like, oh, this doesn't sound like a bad metaphor. Um, I mean, when people are like, oh, there was still bullshit that was happening before colonialism was existing. And I wouldn't disagree with that. Or like, bullshit's a bad term because that's also discriminatory towards animals. But uh, <laughs> but uh, essentially, there was, there, was, there was toxic shit. There was colonial shit happening before colonialism was right. even something or, or a concept that people or indigenous peoples or, or multi-ethnic people thought of in their own countries that doesn't mean colonialism didn't exist just like for example you know because they came from somewhere right they came from those countries colonialism was there but it was like so i would argue that just like the concept of someone saying you know well everything is fine because this community here we don't have rape we don't have torture therefore we live in paradise like you cannot have a concept of ultimate freedom if there are other people oppressed, even if it's in a detached community that has nothing to do directly with you, the influences, even in quantum physics, have been proven to correlate from two opposite ends of the universe, even if there's no contact, no comprehension of these two. So I would say colonialism existed even before we had a notion of colonialism and could have been corrupting non-colonial cultures before they even came to evade them, because that's the reason why they came in the first place. That's, that's what attracted them to do that. So yeah, like to, that's that's how I would look at it. Right. Yeah, that's fascinating. Because I because I, I I I want to study the Incan Empire more because that wasn't that the like the the biggest like superstructure that was here before Columbus. Like because I I try not to romanticize it because but I had I just have this these instincts to you know to put all my you know fantasies about what a utopian society would look like like on on that society and I really wonder like because i source so much of it in patriarchal religion i um, i imagine that the cultures that weren't organized around that not have you know like not having a lot of the problems that we have because yeah see i would say like any like any concept i do believe that even what people have attributed like say you know in stereotypical depictions like say um you know whether it's about the, the um Incan, I believe, would, would have been later on in the Aztec before and then before the, the uh, I, I find, don't, don't quote me on that. I'm not a historian in that sense, but I'm, I'm, I'm much more of a generalist. But uh, yeah, the, the, before the Mayans as well, that you, you had the, the Olmecs and the Toltecs. So from what my, my understanding or from my, my you know, the, the little grasp that I have of that, as I said, I'm not a historian. I do, uh, I am a religious studies scholar at this point, but I haven't, again, I'm, I'm much more of a generalist. I dabble into a lot of different disciplines. So in terms of memory, especially with the amount of marijuana I've smoked in my life, 
you know, specific dates and, and uh, uh, notions like dictionary, like notions. Sometimes they come to me, but other times it's, it's blurry. In terms of that, though, from, from what I understand from Afrocentric history, um, there's a lot of different, uh, some people would call them theorizations. I would say there's a lot of factual basis for the idea that even that, for example, one of the first pre-colonial cultures or empires, I don't know if empire is even the proper name, but again... I know, that's like, what I think, too. I like wonder that, too. Civilization, again, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> so, uh, society in, in, in a non-colonial sense would have been, I would believe, uh, in his or her or their historical times, um, and we're not talking about, like, you know, root races or pre-Diluvian races, but would have been uh, Toltec culture and the idea of uh, how that some people have said, for example, in the, the works of, of different occultists talked about how Thoth, after the exile from um, Egypt and the fall of Egyptian culture and Kemetic culture, uh, had crossed over the uh, Atlantic Ocean into South America and then helped to instore and establish um, Toltec culture, which then, you know, evolved into many different civilizations. Um, around, I believe, like it was like 32 or 30, 3100 BC. But again, those dates are approximative and time is, is non-linear. So the idea of measuring that in a colonial structure with, you know, static numbers based on, on that, it's very deceptive as well. So, but yeah, like from what I, I grasp, those were all huge empires. And I do believe that even the corruptions that people attributed to them in that sense were, again, you know, like, like the album from The Roots, things fall apart. You know, you start with this ideal society, which again, same as, you know, Atlantis, Lemuria, um, all the root races Blavatsky speaks of, or like others, like like Crowley, and, and people have criticized that as well. But Blavatsky to me is huge. Uh, and again, I know very little in terms of, of very specifics. I, I haven't read a single one of her complete books. A lot of them are massive. But, um, mm -hmm. but still, just looking at her life and her biography and her history, the amount that she traveled, the amount that she knew and what she talked about. I, I had to break down some misconceptions with my mom the other day because she was telling me, oh, Blavatsky, you know, she just, you know, at, at first because she didn't know much of anything about it. She had grown up like much more in a, in a kind of, um, I would say more of the, the other side of spirituality's context because she had been mistakenly associated with many stereotypical aspects of occult, um, you know, uh, feminine um, practices. And so she stayed away from- She's that. a witch. <laughs> right. And, and she, she, people still say that to this day, even looking at this house, they think she is, and she's a herbalist, and she, you know, talks to plants and insects and everything. But she was like, yeah, Blavatsky, she didn't write that much, right? She was mostly doing, like, seances, and so I was like, <laughs> so I pulled up her biography, and she was telling me this other, now I forget what her, uh, I think it's Alexandra Niels, huh? I forget now, she's not as known, but my mom was like, I like this one a lot more. And I pulled up her biography and I didn't know who she was at the time. She was a French uh, theosophist as well, who was like, and then I found out that she was one of Blavatsky's pupils and students and she had inspired us. So then my mom was like, what the f So, you know, and that Blavatsky was quoted by like the Dalai Lama at the time and like many other Tibetan authorities as being like one of the most knowledgeable people, even on Vajrayana Buddhism or on other so she was not just the occult person that people believe. She was extremely well versed and balanced in all types of different, um, you know, spiritual traditions and practices, and, and initiated in many different circles, and also very gnostic. Right, and that's kind of, I mean that's kind of what, how I conceptualize the occult and witchcraft in general is just this unearthing of all the spiritual teachings that were suppressed and hidden by the mainstream religion because they weren't useful for the purposes of the people who were writing the rules at the time of the society and a lot of that was men like like we celebrate saint patrick's day like like he was some hero like he was a fucking evil guy that like was responsible for the slaughter of thousands of woke women <laughs> yes exactly i was just reading about, like, like i knew he was patriarchal and i knew he was ignorant and i knew the whole thing about you know like the, this idea of like chasing out the snakes and everything but that's not even just necessarily because a lot of people argue there might not even have been snakes to chase out there that that was literally referring to pagan people to celtic people like how many druids and like yeah like you said women like um i i believe it was like the one story i was reading in particular i, I believe that uh ali Mordekawa shared that story that there was a friend of ali's that was arguing about that and sharing saint patrick something about saint patrick's and celebrating and how he had supposedly accidentally choked to death or drowned the daughter of a druid that he was trying to convert who didn't want to convert to christianity and then she accidentally drowned 
or something along that line. There's right. so many different stories of like, you know what I, like I said, I don't, I'm not very good with specifics, but everybody, anybody can look up any of the information. I think that's the most important aspect is not to take any of what we have at face value. And sometimes some people are like, well, I want credible sources. I want, but I'm like, I want credible independent sources. And also I want to be able to trust my gut feelings. Right. I don't care how many people are like, well, this was studied by 20 different scientists. None of us have the resources to even be able to, 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 to uh, determine, even in a so-called independent context, how independent those people actually are. Right. What are the motivations? Who's behind the scenes paying them to do this? Even if it's so-called, these days there's so much mis misinformation that we don't know. And that's when I was watching an interview by, uh, or an address that Akala, who's like one of my favorite, like most inspirational hip hop artists and, and activists, yeah. intersectional activists gave to uh, uh, Oxford. And it was like an hour and, and 10 minutes. He just breaks down all the bullshit, but does it so politely and, and with a huge smile on his face and like no ego, like practically no ego in, in the expression of that, that nobody can even argue with it. But then here he is with like, technically speaking, as far as I, I, I was looking and again, I don't know much about the technical details of his life, but from what I understood from one of his interviews, he was saying he has very little or like, I don't think he has any official higher education degrees, but I believe he's been awarded many uh, honorary PhDs at this point, which he deserves more than people that I know that probably have 15 or 20 PhDs. He's the most knowledgeable academic, intersectional and, and activist academic right. that I've ever seen. And I know a lot of people that are really powerful activist academics with a lot of, you know, uh, background in, in all kinds of intersectional awareness. Akala trumps all of that with no degrees as far as I know. And I'm like, that is the ultimate proof to me that you don't fucking need this shit. It's a waste of it's a waste of time. It's a waste of resources. The only reason I did that in the first place is a because you know that already. But it's like for, for those of people that don't know, they're like, oh, get you PhD, blah blah blah. I'm like I dropped, I got kicked out of high school twice for selling weed, for for fucking doing like for 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 gang related activity, for fucking you know selling. It for skipping like i don't know like 200 classes in half a year and fucking threatening people and like doing illegal hip-hop concerts and um so i didn't want to do that but then i felt like i had fucked up so much of my life that i felt like i owed it to my mom and my mom was so focused on that and also at that point i was like you know, with these criminal records this mental health history with you know my history of the kind of stuff that i do my personality my aggressiveness and the kind of work that i want to do there's no way I'm not going to end up in jail or shot or kidnapped or fucking, you know, discredited or shoved in a psych ward, which I was half of my life, you know, on and off and, and forced with medication. So I was like, if I have this degree, which is what my mom told me, which is what my uncle does, not he's like, it's a fucking piece of paper. Just get it, get it over with. He has an MBA, started his own company selling, you know, uh, medical supplies that are like, you know, he tries to be more, uh, more cutting edge, more, um, you know, revolutionary in the sense of like upgrading hospitals and, and, and uh, techniques of and and he's very much a conspiracy theorist as well who like built his own kind of hybridization of a, a sweat lodge and a sauna and off-grid cottage where his sauna to my knowledge and i was there i sat in it with it i looked at the thermometer gauge is the hottest sauna on the planet so i was telling that to my mom last night he, 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 you know supposedly there's places in norway like the average sauna in um that's another thing that goes with the whole extremism of my family, my whole family, my uncle, my dad, uh, even my mom, my grandmother, they're all like, you know, they would walk barefoot, they do cold training, they like, you know, spend time in the Arctic, um, would jump in like frozen lakes and do that kind of, so it's like, that's part of my blood. But yeah, my uncle with heat is fucking nuts, like his skin is like dark red and that's, he's like, he looks like a traditional gypsy because he's like, he can sit in that and, and like I said, saunas I think usually are, you know, commercial saunas in a pool, they might be like anywhere between 50 to 65 degrees Celsius or something like that, which in Fahrenheit would be, I, I'm not too sure, like 120, 130 to like maybe 150, 60. Mm. But um, <laughs> the hottest ones, as far as I know, are about uh, like there would be like in Northern Europe uh, in, in certain places would be like around 110, 120 degrees Celsius, which would be like maybe like 200 degrees Fahrenheit or something like that. So past the boiling point of water, basically. And my uncle's sauna, and I was in there, I, I lasted about a minute and I couldn't breathe and my skin felt like it was scorching, like like on fire. Like literally, I was like, this must be what hell would literally feel like. Right. I was in there for like 20, 25 minutes. I was in there for less than a minute. I had to walk out because I couldn't breathe. 
This is like middle of winter, like minus 30. Then he cuts a hole in the ice in his lake and go ju jumps in there. So, but, it, you know, he's like, he looks like a fucking, like a lumberjack. Like he, like he carries like 600 pounds, like, three trunks on his shoulders when he was building his like log house. You know, he's that kind of person. But his was like 150 degrees Celsius, which is like one and a half times the boiling point of water. So like, I don't know, like right. 75, 300 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> right. So what, what are the teachings from that sort of extreme cold and heat training and experiences? Well, to me, it's very much like the, that's like, you know, Wim Hof was like recently has been like a huge influence for me, even if I don't really like I'm very stubborn in that sense. I haven't studied properly enough his technique. I don't even practice it half the time because I don't want to look like a nutcase that's doing heavy breathing, running past people while I'm at the university in the middle of winter and, you know, or get arrested by someone that's like this guy is, is you know, he looks like he's going to kill someone. <laughs> I look, if I was going like, <laughs> and I'm like, there running outside of university with a fucking t-shirt with like dead chickens on it or something that people will be like holy fuck um so i don't really do that properly and i i haven't been able to train well enough because of that or, or reach that kind of record like i'm nowhere near what he can do but still that that it's very much similar like he disproved the existence of the autoimmune system he doesn't ever really get sick uh he believes that not only can we heal ourselves naturally with plants he we don't don't even need plants to heal ourselves technically speaking like he to me he's like the father of mutants from like a european perspective you know he's like the original and i like to call dr hoffer like dr abraham hoffer dr linus pauling to me they're like the grandfather of mutants um which is why like i believe orthomolecular medicine is really like the revolution that the medical industry would have needed that could have integrated western medical principles and, and science you know with like like molecular biology that they founded uh with concepts like shamanism and you know uh, herbalism and animism and, and traditional indigenous practices and, and and so i've tried to kind of merge that after their deaths and, and after you know um pauling died in the mid 90s and, and dr hoffer in the mid 2000s and i was lucky enough to be able to train and, and and uh speak with him for the last three years of his life before he passed away and one of the last things he left me with that i put in one of my songs was uh he said uh, people like you, and he didn't mean me in particular, but he just said at the time, I hadn't done anything special. I don't even barely even knew me, but he said he met people with chemical imbalances, people that are considered to be misfits, disenfranchised, addicted, whatever, that are at the margins of society. He said, you're the future of humanity. And that stayed with me. That's the reason why I created Mutant Academy. That's the reason why I wanted to continue that, because he was one of the only persons that was traditionally trained in psychiatry and molecular biology, a uh, doctor Linus Pauling, like he, you know, co-authored all that double Nobel Prize laureate. They did all their research together. Um, he has like probably about like thirty PhDs, like half of them honorary, but like, like probably, arguably the the one of the greatest, if not the greatest, in terms of achievements and accomplishments, uh, Western European, uh, you know, medical practitioners. And still, people who don't even fucking have a PhD or even a uh, you know, any Nobel Prize or any even lesser prizes are trying to sit there like authorities trying to discredit them as quack scientists. And I'm like, how do you get two Nobel Prizes? There's three people in the history of, no two people actually in the history of Nobel Prize, uh, Nobel Prizes who won two different Nobel Prizes in two different disciplines. The only other one I think is Marie Curie. She was like a woman at like the, tr the turn of the, the 19th century who actually did like a bunch of revolutionary medical research. And she's the only other person in history who actually had two different unrelated Nobel Prizes. So when you get to that level of even Western mainstream academic recognition, you have like 30 different PhDs who founded molecular biology, which now is like a hugely, um, you know, important and influential discipline. And people are still trying to say you're a quack doctor because molecular biology has nothing to do with nutrition. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, how do people not see the interconnectedness of that? that? So, but it's funny to me because those, those are the same people trying to say, like, there's nothing wrong with eating bacon. It's not bad for your health. And like, <laughs> you know, um, so it's, it's dumb shit. Like I've seen, and I've seen even orthomolecular nutritionists and doctors say stupid shit that's not science-based. So it's not like that's immune from anything. But right. in general, I have a huge distrust. You know, it's the same thing with you. And I love that you brought up anarchy too as well in there. Because to me, it's not even just about, I wouldn't call myself spiritually aware or enlightened, but in the sense of a cult reality, like like Karis One that we are talking about earlier. I like that concept of endarkenment. Because I wouldn't say I'm endarkened either in the sense of enlightened, because then it just becomes an oppositely egotistical construct. But right. I would say I strive towards endarkenment much more than enlightenment. That's why to me, melanated people are the original and darkened people literally and and 
you know, psychically and spiritually. Um, because that melanin, that knowledge is embedded within their skin. Just like the idea of like a sacral four is like a really uh, interesting uh, comedic, um, I would say like scientist or prescientist um, and kind of like occultist, you know, uh, kind of intersectional uh, scientific revolutionary uh, scholar who talked a lot about the, the, those types of, of very advanced concepts in terms of like, you know, metaphysics and uh, metagnostics, uh, Sophianism, and, and also like kind of, I would say, futurist science in that sense, or comedic science. Right. Um, and talked about the embedded knowledge within melanin, which, you know, I've, I've explained differently too as well, like within metaphors of, of Karis one, this idea of like hydrogen being the primordial element and then the sun radiating that hydrogen, which literally means like, created from water right. so um generated from hydro like hydroelectricity so so that primordial element and also corresponds to knowledge is the primordial element of creation which is the primordial element of the hip-hop culture as well which is embedded within the melanin of african people who created hip-hop so right. then all of that links in together and then science and prescience like you can't have science without pre-science and so you know as much as people are like well you need you know, this isn't scientific. I'm like, how do you think those scientists came up with those ideas? You know, like they didn't, it, you can research, you can practice certain amounts of experiences that lead you to a result. But if you don't have the intuition, the ability to critically deconstruct that from a, like a non-linear or non-conventional perspective, you can do all the experience you want. It's like people continually testing fucking products on animals that they already know are toxic and, and deleterious, thinking this is advancing science or saving lives. No, it's not. If you had that, you know, prescience, if you had that intuition, you'd be like, oh, wait, this is bad for humans. This is bad for animals. We don't even need to poison or torture or martyr beings to figure this out. We're just a bunch of idiots who forgot how to be in touch with our, like our gut feeling, which literally is about the gut. It's about your bacteria. So if the, 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 you know, your gut feelings, um, if your gut is corrupted by the food that you're eating and by toxic products and and essences and, and colonially commodified substances, then you will be misled by your intuition and your gut feeling as much as it feels right is going to be the expression of those toxic substances and, and enslaved constructs, which is perpetuating your own colonial karma. Right. right. Sorry, that's, that's a lot of a rant, but it's like, I'm, I'm like, I was just telling my mom last night, actually, like when I'm here, because I'm here to renovate like the Nikito Walk Academy. So I'm in the basement right now, like which I'm redoing the flooring and like, I've been like just, yeah, just going nuts at it lately. I haven't made music for like a month and a half. But I was just telling her last night, just having that conversation with you was enough to like get me like really, really lucid. And I could be sitting around people sometimes I can't even express myself. But then with somebody that I can relate to and a like mind on a similar frequency, suddenly, which to me, again, it, it relates. Yeah, I'm like, oh, you're way. intelligent. You're like, you know, you're, you're very gifted at this. And I'm like, I'm just channeling other people too. So right now I'm channeling you as much as like, this and people might be like, oh, this is really intelligent. I'm channeling, you know, Keras One and all these different people I'm talking about metaphorically and literally their influence and their knowledge is, is, you know, being transmuted through that. And if I didn't give credit and acknowledge that, it wouldn't be possible. Right. And that's hip hop to me, that where it brings in everything. It's like sampling and remixing and bringing in all, everything. And so that's why, that's why I think it can be a global culture and can be the future of culture because it can, because it's radically inclusive it, and, and for anyone can participate. Anyone can tell their story. Anyone's experience of what it means to be human and exist in this world is valid, you know, so we can all write ourselves into history and, and so I, that's what is so beautiful about hip hop and all these people throughout the, it's crazy thinking about that hip hop's only been around for, for 40 years, but I, I love the way that Keras One does the reference to the original elements of culture, you know, riding on the cave wall and making noises with our mouths and dancing around a campfire and beating on the table or, you know, I guess logs at that yeah. point. No, it all started with shamanism and animism. And that, I, I love that too. I used to teach that in history of graffiti as well. It's very, very true. And how he doesn't just, a lot of people are like, there's four elements of hip hop. And people are like, no, there's five. People forget beatboxing. And somebody like, oh, there's six. People forget knowledge. And then, you know, Karis One's like, no, there, there's nine elements, which the other three, like, and, and, and now I, I'm, I'm going to sound like an idiot because I'm like, I don't even, I, I know there's like, there's street culture, there's street uh, clothing. Um, and I forget if it's like, to me, those are, they are elements in, in and of themselves, but they're also kind of, in a sense, almost like 
not quite secondary elements, but they're not quite as primordial as something like knowledge would be in a sense. They, they are essential to the culture. And I forget now, like I said, I feel like I'm so used to just hearing all the time talking about the six main elements or the five main elements that the, the last three, now I can't even, the, the one escapes me in the, the particular nomenclature, but, but the idea is like that is more related to recent urban hip hop culture rather than like say what you're expressing about shamanism or about other, although again, in those times they had particular dresses, particular ways to express themselves, but the way that that slang or that particular type of clothing associated with hip hop has evolved is a much more recent phenomena that is not, to me, it, it's, it's modified itself in a way where now somebody doesn't necessarily need to abide by what would be considered to be a traditional urban expression of what hip hop would be clothing wise or even slang wise to actually be hip hop because it's, it's hybridizing itself and it's evolving. So, but in that sense, that would also evolve the notion of that term. Right, right. Definitely. Sorry, hold on real quick. Hermit's cat is in here. I got to let him out. I didn't notice. Yeah, no, no, no. He's no, no. Oh, good. Yeah, he came yeah. out and he's like trying to get up. <laughs> cats, cats are amazing shamanic beings, so that's awesome. <laughs> right. That's a good transition towards animals because the same, like I have a wolf dog here that I've had for like, you know, um, uh, Nanook, like it means it means an animal worthy of great respect and Nanook to it. And um, she's one of the most amazing beings. Like, she's been the greatest guardian in my life. And like, you know, she's like, she's almost 16 years old now. By all accounts, like, you know, veterinarians and other people, like, she should logically be dead. Uh, she should have died. She's a German Shepherd, Wolf, um, Husky, Border Collie, Cross. It's probably about 90 pounds. It's a pretty big dog, but not, like, huge, huge. But she's, like, bursting with energy. She's great. She's, like, almost 16. She, that would be, like, 110 years old in human years. She grew up on it. Like, she was, she's from an indigenous reserve. She's been like a wild dog most of her life. She's spent winters out, like many winters out at minus 40, minus 50, you know. So she grew up very much like an Arctic dog or like an indigenous dog would have. But I've been feeding her most of her life. I either fed her just straight up like very healthy, um, you know, for a bit when my mom wasn't around or when I wasn't around, she was being fed dog food again, but like with a lot of uh, nutritional elements and only made from like wild salmon and yams and like other uh, additives. But Mm-hmm. when I came back and for, you know, maybe I would say half of her life or more and to, up until, you know, um, like to this day now for the past years too, she's been uh, completely vegan in ITAL and she's mm-hmm. healthier than like any other dog. Of course, randomly, if she ever runs around, because I, I don't walk her on a leash, I don't even believe in that. And we live, you know, just outside of, uh, well, Nikita Degwa, because like probably an hour and a half, two hours outside of Montreal, but it's like uh, there's... 160, 170,000 people around this area and the, the greater region. And so it's kind of an urban area and it's illegal to do that, but she knows her perimeter. She knows the cops too. She knows how to avoid them, how to escape, how to come back. And she's got an acre of like forest and land to roam around on here. So everybody in the neighborhood knows her. And the last time somebody was like, well, that's threatening. I don't want your dog looks dangerous. Uh, you should have her on a leash. I was like, listen, she's the equivalent of a 110 year old. Would you walk your great grandmother on a fucking leash? And the lady looked at me kind of like scared for a second. She was like, oh, it's okay. I understand. Don't worry about it. And so people don't think about the level of like conditioning and speciesism that we have towards animals. Like I feed her the exact same stuff. I cook something right now. She looks at me and she like, you know, she's like, oh. I'll be like, yo, here, let me make you a, uh, you know, like I'll make her, uh, I don't know, like a spelt, like organic, like raisin bread toast with some like uh, tahini on it and, uh, you know, a bit of like, um, some homemade like uh, black chocolate or something and I'm like and they say dogs shouldn't have chocolate it's because most chocolate is fucking commercially processed and toxic and has a bunch of other shit in it but it gives you a lot of energy it's a sacred you know uh, um, remedy to indigenous uh, you know South American peoples cocal is like it's a, it's a very ceremonious substance so used responsibly when it's fair trade direct trade horizontal trade and you use it in the right dosages for the right purposes it's amazing and she eats anything like I'll cook freaking you know, like a stir fry with a ton of curry and like mad spices in it. Um, she eats super spicy. She'll eat nutritional yeast, spirulina, mango peels, and everything is organic. And I feed her like local, like I, I give her local spring water to drink because the shit, I don't want to give her chlorinated, fluorinated water. Like I know a lot of people can't, you know, they can't afford it. I make like less than 15 grand a year. And that like, half of that isn't even, a fit. my official salary last year on the books was $6,000. And the other 10,000 10, is a grant and I have to pay 5,500 in uh, tuition fees. So realistically, I'm living like twice underneath poverty level. Right. And I still manage to do nothing <laughs> like, you know, organic uh, food. And I dumpster dive a lot and I you repurpose. And I could feed, I fed an entire like, you know, vegan right. community space with like 
55 rooms and 20,000 square feet with, mm -hmm. um, you know, with dumpster diving. Yeah, I've so, seen some of those epic dumpster diving holes that you pull in. Like, you find s amazing stuff. Like, I, it's I'm not, and it, uh, that's, that's a stroke of luck, too, right? You have to find the right places. Some places it's not possible to do that in food deserts or in other places. I was very lucky and very privileged in that sense. But even then, that privilege is not a conventional Western privilege that most people think of. Because a lot of people would be like, well, fuck that. I'm not going into a dumpster. I'm not going to go behind this store. And like, you have to talk to people. You have to, because the owners will see you eventually. They'll, right. You know, they'll, um, oh, that, that's, is that your mom? That's, that's my mom. Hello. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, it's interesting that uh, I, I recognize that privilege, but at the same time, a lot of people wouldn't want that privilege and they prefer to pay for upscale food that looks better to them but that actually probably has more toxic products and is more dangerous for their health than what i'm eating which mm -hmm. ironically they might be like oh it's unsuitable um and i don't support like i i do eat mostly vegan but i rather use the term ital because to me vegan isn't as nearly as specific we've talked about that before too but mm -hmm. i don't believe that veganism is necessary for everybody because I don't believe veganism has been properly defined uh, and even what most people consider to be vegan according to standard guidelines is not actually vegan. So to me, veganism is much closer to the Rasta concept, the Rasta concept of being ital, which is, you know, like I've said before and I've said a lot of tracks to Jesus, Yeshua was a Rasta. Like he was a Middle Eastern Rasta, he was a Nazarene. That means he had a creed not to have any material possessions, not to have a permanent residence, not to eat any animal byproducts, including even like milk and cheese in most cases. Um, no domesticated products, only wild products, maybe occasionally wild fish, which is why the, there's this thing about the multiplication of fishes. But even then, there's some debate as to, you know, between religious studies scholars about whether that was a mistranslation of a fish shaped loaf of bread in Greek or if it was actually a fish but even then he was multiplying fish that had already been fished he didn't fish them himself so he considered himself a fisher of the souls of men but uh and notice then to me that's not a mistranslation because the souls of women don't need fishing to be saved um you know or the souls of queer people or whatever so when people are saying mankind is evil or something i'm like that's not a misnomer I do believe that that is, you know, right. people who readily identify with men and think that men are an embodying nomenclature for all of the rest of gender or non-gender uh, existence. Right. Just like people who think America means the United States, it's a misnomer. It's it's a it's a mis like a, it's, it's 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 a lack of proper expression. It's ignorance. Right. Right. Totally. Yeah. And it's not acknowledging the diversity of humanity I, f I feel like that's one of the things that like all these systems of oppression try to p force a a monoculture you know like that it's male and hetero and rich and white and christian and it's just like this very specific prescriptive thing that you know wasn't aristotle said uh man is the measure of all things <laughs> the, what are the what yeah. are the best and you know, that's not even a, a misnomer either that's not even like the wrong uh statement because things don't exist that's the reason why like you know buddha said there is no thing so as soon as you say so man is the measure of all things it makes total sense because <laughs> things only exist because of patriarchy so, <laughs> so so i think there's a lot of you know so-called great european or eurocentric right. thinkers that didn't realize that, that you know when they say that the wise man knows himself to be a fool and the fool thinks himself to be wise so i think there's a lot of wise people that are still considered wise to these days that you know were foolishly wise in a sense and didn't realize that mm. um thought that this was this great statement but and it was but it was like the other way around right right exactly and that's because aristotle was plato's student and so i i don't know of aristotle being initiated into Eleusis or having even traveled to Egypt he may have but I know Plato did and 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 Socrates did and so there because Aristotle set up the, his school of philosophy to be 
in opposition to Plato's Academy, which was trying to bring the wisdom that he learned in Africa to Greece. And so, and Aristotle was like, yeah, no, fuck all that. <laughs> I'm going to do something different than that. <laughs> you know, I got to throw in some hip hop references in there because I still, it just popped up in my mind. And I remember li listening to that. I think it was off Revolutionary Volume 1 from Immortal Technique. And I have some issues with some of the older stuff too, in terms of misogyny or like, you know, some ignorance against the vegan movement or other stuff. I want to clarify too. When I say that veganism is not what it should be, and I don't, I don't fish personally, I don't hunt, although I was raised like that by my, my, uh, my father taught me those principles, but, um, you know, from a mythological perspective, like a deep, profound respect for these uh, animals to the point where, like, if you don't have a, a direct telepathic connection and, and grasp with that, if there's no fear whatsoever, and the animal literally offers its life to, to you in expectance of a transcendence to a higher realm and a reincarnation in a better uh, uh, reality, and you're using every single part of that animal like sustainably and, and you know properly and ceremoniously which i can't possibly do I, i've never met a person in my life that can actually do that i believe in that principle theoretically and mythologically and i wouldn't ever tell someone don't do that but i'm like the level of, of knowledge and, and spirituality and awareness and connection to nature you need to have in symbiosis is something that even many uh, you know uh or a lot of different indigenous peoples that i've met these days because of the effects of colonialism are not even fully in touch with anymore not to say that they can't be but because of systemic structures of oppression and the way that nature has been polluted and corrupted it's almost impossible for animals to even be on that level to be able to say oh this is okay because they're thinking i'm sick right. you should eat you're gonna get sick if you do that but the plants is the same principle i just want to say that I don't support any unsustainable industry or food and the animal agriculture industry in general is the greatest destruction of the environment of the you know the rainforest of all forests of erosion of land of the pollution of water the use of resources droughts uh, ten thousand liters of, of fresh water for one kilo of, of fresh beef um it's completely insane it's like a third of a lifetime's uh worth of, of fresh water for a human being to, to, to live so for for like one fucking big steak in america and, or in the U.S. And so, and the same with like, you know, the, the not just that, but the greatest genocide in, in, in history, literally, which is another track that I made um, on an Amos the Ancient Prophet, Pete, which is like, Pete, that, that, that dude is amazing. Like in terms of producers, I've been so grateful to work with so many different people um, who have done like, you know, some legendary work in terms of bringing, you know, about change and paradigm shifts in hip hop. But yeah, that, that it is. When we look at every other, when you got Holocaust survivors that came out of, concentration camps saying i'm vegan now and i started a vegan activist a group to dismantle animal agriculture industry because what we've suffered in the holocaust it's dwarfed in comparison to and dwarfed again my apologies that's, that's a really bad use of a term and I, I hate this is why i hate colonial languages because no matter what you think of there's always a way that's that's why they, they you know i gave a conference on the the idea of double speak uh which is like you know the same as in 1984 right new speak so it's like freedom means oppression, this means that, this. So there's always a way, this is why you can't ever win when you're speaking a colonial language, because it could always be misinterpreted. It's a language that leads to the confusion of tongues, literally. But, uh, but yeah, I want to, like, I support veganism, at, like, 100% in its ideal state, which is to say, you know, if you're vegan, you should not be ordering imported cashews from slave labor children in Asia and, like, thinking, oh, this is labeled vegan. Or, oh, well, this is human slave labor. I've heard of, like, as much as I hate to say this, I've heard vegans mostly, regrettably, um, you know, privileged, more middle-aged, like white passing first world vegans or vegans, quote unquote, say, well, veganism is all about animal uh, rights. It's not about human rights. So I don't care about slave labor. It's not about veganism. I'm like, that's speciesism. Like what you're doing right now is you're saying people care more about humans than animals. So I'm going to care more about animals than humans, even though I'm in a privileged condition as a human and I'm exploiting other human beings from other ethnicities that are that I'm dependent upon for my veganism to be made into this trophy that I can tout to other people as the saving of the world when it's really destroying the planet as well. So to me, veganism, real veganism is about sustainability, which ironically, a lot of indigenous people, if they hunt one moose for like a whole winter and feed the entire family with that and have like 2,000 pounds of meat, that's one life that literally has no carbon footprint impact on the entire planet in terms of transport or slave labor or anything else. To me, that is more vegan than somebody eating a bunch of fucking, you know, like gourmet $30 a plate meals with like 20 different imported items packaged in plastic that were shipped halfway across the planet and involve a lot of slave labor that they don't care about.
And to clarify, a lot of people think organic means there's no slave labor. Fuck no. In general, in the cocoa industry, it seems to be the case that they, and again, it's according to like even what we consider to be fair trade. That's like a minimum basis because a lot of people don't realize fair trade in a country could mean, you know, the non-fair trade shit that we consider slave labor is like, oh, they get paid like 60 cents a day. Fair trade is like, oh, they get paid a buck 20 a day. Right. And, and still exactly. that in that country, they're like, well, I'm balling because I make 600 a year. You make 300. But for most people here, they'd be like, yo, this is like abject poverty. So to me, this is why like a company like say Chocosol in Toronto, their horizontal trade, coffee and chocolate. So that means even if you're dealing with a country that has like a fucking, you know, net income in it for, for average citizen of 300 bucks a year, you pay them what you would pay a, a, a decently paid worker in Canadian conditions. Right. So you directly, you know, you're directly exchanging with farmers, no representative of the farm, no authority, no anything. It's like ground level, like horizontal trade. Right. So it's beyond direct trade. So you have fair trade, direct trade, horizontal trade. So right. short of being there directly with the person getting the product from that, that is the highest standard, but they're the only company I've ever met in my life that does that. So I'm sure there's others, but see, but that's the reason why, like I talked about stuff like on, on Revolt Motion, you can find the Beyond Fair Trade section. There's stuff about that I just added recently about um, Earth Water, Earth Tea, Earth Coffee, Tea Tibet, um, and another company that's way more commercial, but that actually does have uh, completely nonprofit products as well, which is Newman's Own. Um, so they do have some non-vegan products as well that I don't support. Like I said, uh, it's more, and I don't know what kind of ingredients they have in there, but to me, I would love to start a coffee shop one day that's just based on reusing, on dumpster diving, on repurposing, like Charity 360, I think is an organization that, that um, uh, actually does stuff like that, that repurposes, you know, uh, organic food and food from other places, and then brings it to, uh, you know, cafes, community places, and reuses it for community purposes at a minimum donation price, or even free for some people who need it. To me, that's the future of what society should be. That's what fair trade really should be. And the weird thing with the French-English thing that is interesting as well is that this idea of fair in English, which is when you say, that's fair, it's good, but it's like, you know, you're like, eh, fair enough. It's like, I'm not going to argue this, but whereas in French, fair trade, like according to official standards, is literally translated as commerce équitable, which again shows you the difference between romance languages and, you know, hegemonic you know, more kind of like less emotional, less expressive languages like English, like Anglo-Saxon languages and some derivatives, in some cases at least. It's just commerce équitable, is, the, the transliteration of that would be equitable commerce. So equitable and fair to me are two significantly different concepts because equity is not even equality. It's like, no, if a person has been profoundly oppressed and you have a millionaire and a person that makes 300 bucks a year, Equality in some definitions of, you know, purely dictionary like, like reference would be like, okay, I give a million to this person, I give a million to this person. Equity would be like, this person needs nothing, this person needs the million. So I'm going to take the other million, give it to somebody else who's also in that position. So to me, that's what fair trade really should be. It should be equitable trade, which is what horizontal trade is. But, you know, it, again, in English and hegemonic context, you have this deceptive branding of advertising which is like oh don't worry it's fair it's good enough um and and then all these different companies like like um yeah. I, I don't know like all the companies are like we're helping the third world that were started by like you know rich western people that are like we're giving jobs to women in africa but they're like multi-millionaires running all these plants and the women in africa they're not even publishing the figures of what they're paying them which is again maybe a little bit more than what other people are paid but it's still exploitation so there, there's a lot to know about it. It seems really, really complicated. But at the end of the day, I was just explaining that to my mom yesterday too. Where she's like, oh, there's so much to think about. You know, sometimes it gets overwhelming. And I'm like, it seems like that because we live in an acidic system. So we live in a system that's based not only just metaphorically, but like, you know, uh, literally on acidic principles. The food is acidic. It's overprocessed. It's too literally acid. It's fried. It's deep fried. It's like versus alkaline or basic, which is raw or nature, which is fresh uh, and organic. So if you keep it basic, that's how life should be. And so when people are like, oh, that's a basic, you know, whatever, like, you know, person, or that's a basic this, like derogatory term, that actually should be a compliment, just like the term pussy should be a compliment. Right. When somebody says like, oh, this is complex, or this is like, that's what Western culture and, and Eurocentric academia and generalism over 
you know, and ironically, I'm using a lot of vocab and complex expressions to explain, which is an acidic concept, but yeah, I was you trained. Use mad complex language. <laughs> but I try to deconstruct it with that, right? And I try to keep it accessible and basic in some ways as, as well. Okay. And which is what I, you know, my music, some of it is, is very complex, but in other shit that I have is a lot more accessible depending on the different albums and, and you know, different songs and, and, and different people that I work with. But yeah, that's what it should be, is that basic should be wonderful. And it, it should be basic to think about what we think of these complex, acidic explanations for torture and genocide and abuse and, and completely unacceptable uh, practices like slave labor and exploitation and, and unsustainability and pollution, instead of just looking at the basic reality of like, do I need to eat cashews right now? Do I need to pay, you know, uh, oh, well, I can't afford a fair trade chocolate bar. Then don't fucking eat the chocolate. Like I'm like, or I can't, you know, all oh, this coffee, Tim Hortons is way cheaper. Or like, you know, McDonald's is 99 cents. I'm like, go get a fucking bag of fair trade coffee and make your own coffee. Like, and then it's going to be cheaper than McDonald's and you'll still get fair trade or equitable or direct trade. It's like, mm -hmm. but people like to think of complex explanations to say that simple shit is complex and complex shit is simple right exactly exactly yeah that's that's the key because like because on some level you know we do live in a global civilization with seven billion people so there's complexity that needs to be navigated in a way that like for example food labeling laws and agencies and it's like that it seems to me that that needs to be expanded much more because I, I feel like and we have to push the norms more towards i mean and transparency in general because i think that's a lot of why people don't why people go around doing things that they you know wouldn't morally vouch for having done is because they don't know what they're doing <laughs> for, forgive them not, for they know not what they do yeah or they don't remember because i think it's like it's not even that we don't have that not because that we have different type of knowledge like wim hof was saying right our knowledge like with paler skin people and i'm a mix of a lot of different cultures but like the paler genetics that like we're associated with the cold versus the heat so we have a different type of, of knowledge, which is you know, a different type of wisdom as well, which can be very beneficial. But if we're disconnected from that original element and from the nature that comes with it, then we don't have that awareness and we don't remember. But um, it's, it's actually just like a lot of different spiritual traditions talk about unlearning, deprogramming versus if you reprogram, people are like, oh, you need to learn this, you need to learn that. But if you've got a glitchy computer full of viruses, you don't uninstall the viruses, and you keep adding new programs on top of the spyware, it's not going to function better. It's going to be even slower. And mm -hmm. it's going to be more So it's like, that's why I like to think sometimes I'm like, I'm, I'm more of a neurological hacker than a rapper or like, a, you know, because uh, I'm not a, a master of ceremony. I don't master ceremonies. I'm not a master. And I don't do ceremonies in that sense, even though in a decolonial sense, I totally respect that. Mm -hmm. But that's not my original culture. I'm much more of a, of a spoken word poet and a storyteller. So, and, and a hacker. So that, that is what I do. And that's what all good hip hop should be, um, you know, hacking in a certain sense or like, um, uh, I think it's uh, most staff that actually said he was a neuro linguistic rap hypnotist, which I think that's awesome because oh. you're hypnotizing people to be able to go into their deep unconscious and reprogram or deprogram concepts. That's another, but then also a lot of people are like the Biggie song hypnotized. It's like, and not, not to just that, I, I love Biggie in many different ways and Tupac as well, but you know, there's they're a product of, of their times and, and we all are. Right. So you can learn from that and evolve in syncretics and, and kind of absorb and assimilate the good and the bad and all of that and then transmute it. But, but that idea that a lot of the rap industry, as you know, is like it's a hypnotizing of the masses and, and, and a mind manipulation for the purpose of enrichment and colonialism and perpetuating certain values like Too Short and Dre and, and, and Snoop in that hidden 90s, um, you know, meeting with the record execs and, and prison execs that were like, hey, here's a couple million prison shares, get some people in there, start rapping about 40s and drugs and fucking all this shit, and we'll give you lots of prison shares and you can make a lot of money. The more people you put in prison, the more money you'll make. Mm -hmm. You know, what came out about that, talked about it, dropped out of that, Snoop dropped out of that. Dre, as far as I know, I mean, he doesn't openly talk about that anymore. He's vegan now and a bunch of other shit, but he still just republished his chronic album, which I grew up on. I was still to this day. I still had shit in my mind that was influenced by that. One of the reasons why I got into criminal activities and all kinds of other shit, not to blame rap for it, but like I could have used that revolutionarily like Tupac did, which is another like great influence to me or like, you know, many other rappers like Nas or like other people that balance mm -hmm. those sides. To yeah, me, 
So I hate to say it, I'm not saying Dre is all bad, but especially if you look at all the, the shit from those days, I mean, from NWA to after that meeting, there was a huge shift, like Ice right. Cube from The Predator, and then after that, that's one of the tracks I did recently. I was like, what happened to those activist days? Like The Predator, man, I missed the old school. So it's like- mm -hmm. They left that part out of straight out of Compton. <laughs> I just want to say to you, like, just in case that happens, you know, earlier, but that I was, I said I was going to save that story. So like right now I'm on this, like, I don't know, six, seven year old, like touchscreen, like 10 inch laptop that barely, it took me like tw like 10, 20 minutes to boot it up. And the, the battery charger was fucked. It wouldn't work. And it hasn't worked for like two or three months. So if it ever shuts off, because as soon as I turned on the computer, it stopped charging like yesterday. So now it's running off the battery. I don't know when it will, but for anybody else who's listening as well, if it ever cuts off in the middle, that's the end of the interview. I'm sorry. I've been <laughs> off grid. I'm like, we don't have Wi. This isn't even Wi-Fi. This is ADSL, like I said, and it's a co-op run ADSL. So it's a nonprofit like organization. has like really slow internet, but for some reason, it's good enough to do this right now because it's a low pixel camera on an old like computer. So. Um, right. Right, totally. And but that I just wanted to say that. And to anybody else who wants to reach us, if, if for some reason, if something, check out the website. Uh, I'm gonna check my email when I go to the reserve or the village nearby when I'm renovating the the, the Métis uh, Matapedia Academy Lodge that we're just uh, gonna be working on for like you know I'll be working with the Micmac and Métis Council of, of Gaspesia. So I'll I'll be protecting like probably about like I don't know like officially the territories would be about uh, like 419, 418 acres of land, but then there's thousands of other acres of phonic reserve and I want to protect it as much as possible from trappers, hunters, like illegal poachers and people like that around those lands and make sure that it's completely sustainable off grid. All of them are running off of spring fed water from the woods. Um, we're going to get some solar panels for the roof, but right now they're running off of, um, you know, wood furnaces, uh, wood, um, uh, wood stoves in there. Like one of them is the original 1870, uh, Métis, uh, fishing guide Academy. Um, or lodge from uh, the lord of the region, the colonial lord back then, and then the other ones are, you know, within a, a thousand kilometer spectrum along the Appalachian Mountains. So, to anyone who wants to reach me, hit up Revolt Motion, revolt-motion.com, go to the contact us section. That goes straight to a personal email that I'll be checking hopefully about once a week when I go to a village or somewhere and bring this little laptop and hopefully get another secondhand charger somewhere in between. And, um, you know, and a, yeah. Yeah, and so that that reminds me because well, I mean, I'm the, the, I, I doubt we'll get to like I, I literally have three three pages worth of questions. Uh, no, no, please, uh, please, sorry, I, I talk way too much because I'm like I'm stoked about a lot of these synchronicities. No, like, that's, event, that's why I'm not. That's why I wasn't trying to stop you because I know that you're a fountain of wisdom. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, but the thing is, again, that's like you again. If this was a person right now that was like, "Yo, you're full of shit. You're a hypocrite. You fucking spiritual fuck boy." La la la. Probably I might even be like half full of ego and say a bunch of delusional half true shit because I'd be reflecting their own anger and animosity and bullshit. So in order for me to be even speaking sensibly or any of the albums I've created that people are like, oh, this is so, those are the muses. Those are the beat makers. Those are the people that inspire me to do that. Those are the people, the artists that, you know, gave me that wisdom to begin with. Those are people like Yugen Blackrock, like Saw Rock, like Son of Saturn, like Bliss, like, you know, um, many different, like, like Rishi, like Stranded, like even Atma back in the days, as much as we had our differences in terms of homophobia and different spiritual, you know, concepts, um, we all evolve, we all grow, and we all, you know, we all have our own limitations and, and, and issues. And I have much love, and, and all those people are kindred to me, regardless of whatever differences we might have had through the ages. And I do understand it's just a temporary illusion in terms of, a real illusion, but a temporary byproduct of, of, of colonial divide and conquer tactics so i don't want to buy and dwell into that too much but but anyways yo go ahead with the questions and, and yeah <laughs> for sure so yeah with uh with mutant academy uh, I'll, I'll start there i guess my uh, the big thing i wanted to ask about that because so, like there's two different versions of education two different ideas of a pur the purpose of education which is just like the training <laughs> model which is like what western industrial schooling is about and where it's just like trying to like force kids to all conform and be obedient and then the other version of what education can be is the calling forth of the of the innate wisdom that that we all have and so i can kind of conceptualize what i've gathered from the pedagogical philosophy of mutant academy i guess is the the latter so it's like trying to to speak to the kids who 
the you know the the round pegs for the square holes or whatever the 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 ones yeah. the ones who the industrial factory conformity you know is it won't stick or something because mm -hmm. there are like because I think that that's where the future will come from like you were saying at, at, at the very beginning is that there's people with visions who have consciously or unconsciously willingly or unwillingly rejected a lot of the lies and everything that was that that was attempted to be to be installed into us and so I was wondering you know like what the you know how you Re what kind of outreach you do and what kind of like h how mutant academy is trying to be an antidote to some of those things and to be an alternative um, educational framework yo for, for sure and honestly it is very much like you you know me like it i'm i'm you know ironically enough a lot of people consider me an extremist but you know the, the, the same type of the people who think that way are people who don't consider it you know extreme to uh you know, commit mass genocide on an unprecedented scale in the past, like, you know, 10,000 years and, uh, you know, enslave and, and, and repeatedly rape mothers, pump shit out of their breasts and then split up their offspring in tiny little pieces because they think it tastes good regardless of their health benefits or, you know, third world famine or depopulation or deforestation. Or, so to me, that's a hell of a lot more extreme. But in terms of that, like Mutant Academy is, is more each academy is different and it's not necessarily like none of it is an overarching concept in the sense of a hierarchy or a structure like i'm not the president or ceo or director of any of that we all created that as a as a non-profit basis together many different artists from like you know unknown misery of babylon war child some of the original founders or like like Ananke from salt spring island as well was like a like a, an intersectional like queer um poet and and, and painter um and uh there are like many other people as well, like you know, the DJ Billy Bishop, like Jacob of all from the, the, the kids to like um, you know, all the other people, Sol Shinobi from Sweden as well, like you know, Ali Dehesh. Um, so and, and they expanded like wait, I don't even want to start naming all, all the people originally they're like Casa, you know, uh, 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 OJ Burning Burma, like so, so many different people like originally were from you know, the, the groups, the core groups are from, you know, Caitlin Gray, um, you know, Dana, Silverthorne, um, you know, Rudiger Slav, like Merrill, um, a, a bunch of other people from Toronto to Vancouver. It was mostly Canadian based originally when we did that first tour with Play HIV orphans in, in, in Africa um, through uh, Plan Canada's Match Gifts because it was, you know, non religious, non uh, as much as like all so called charities are still have a byproduct of uh, uh, unintentional colonialism in it some of them are far more efficient than others and at the end of the day people that are like well a lot of people are like i don't fucking do charity i don't believe in that i'm like so what do you do then do you do community outreach do you like what do you invest your money most people are like well i don't trust any of it i'm like oh that's great so you're doing nothing then <laughs> and so i'd rather do research and look up and you can look them up independently like plan canada's rated on many different independent charity evaluators uh mutant academy is meant to be a decolonial and intersectional initiative to teach sustainability, but also not even just to teach, but to relearn and reteach ourselves and rekindle that. But as you said, that forgotten wisdom inside of us, not just spiritually, but also, yeah, like sustainably, intersectionally, but also metaphysically, paranormally, in, in a similar sense to the idea of the X-Men, but again, in the sense of like, if you have women and men and X-Men to me, or X-Men, like with a Y instead, would be like kind of like the idea of the mutant in between that's neither one gender nor the other nor even the third gender but is kind of a gray spectrum in the middle and i do believe that there's a lot of colonial aspects and, and you know racist even unintentional racist aspects of many comic books and colonial aspects of superheroes working for government organizations in the united states and supervillains we're not trying to reproduce any of that but i think anything can be blueprinted and rescripted and, and transmuted into other concepts and the idea of mutant to me just like misfits is, a, is an interesting one. And I like that a lot more than the idea of superhero or supervillain or, or even the idea of the invisible. Right. Cause more. yeah. Cause, uh, cause both mutiny in an organization it describes rebellion and just in general, a uh, mutation in biology is how evolution happens. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, and, and it is constant. Evolution is the only constant. So when mm -hmm. people are like, this person will never change, the world never changes. I'm like, that is the only concept that has been scientifically proven to be a, a constant. And that is, everything else is a variable. But evolution is constant, which means variables are constant. 
so it's like this weird paradox of like a Zen cone when people are like, well, how is this, if this is true, then how could that, that when, when you're stuck in a binary frame, which sadly enough has to do with heteronormativity and patriarchy and religion, people don't understand how two seemingly contradictory statements can coexist. But as soon as you think about it, you're like, oh, right. I mean, if you sit in a, long, in a room long enough and you start hallucinating that a black wall becomes white or a white wall becomes black or suddenly a blank construct is full of flowers and fractals, you get how contradictions can occur. Or if you start hearing pictures or seeing sounds like, uh, you know, synesthesia, it's like then, which, you know, tracked by Bliss and Son of Saturn off uh, the beat poets Inner Space Odyssey 2012. So... It's incredible to think about that from that perspective. And that, like you're saying, it's like once you open that box, once you realize that the rainbow, you know, the idea of the LGBTQ plus rainbow, I'm not going to start getting into all the other numbers because it, it expands, it resorbs, there's other letters that get added. But I just, I'm, at this point, I'm like, I used to say LGBTQIA2S plus, but then I'm like, okay, I'll just keep it more, yeah. yeah doesn't the Q, isn't, the, isn't queer an umbrella term? For sure, all of it that's, like I've, I've said that you know that that's the problem i think like even within the queer community within the activist community there's so much divide and conquer me and ali used to talk about that a lot too it's so sad that people sit there talking about their own oppression while they're cooking a steak that's destroying the environment and fighting against it or like that people are supporting rape while they're fighting against rape or that they're selling hot dogs to raise money for cystic fibrosis when diseases happen from those types of it's like <sighs> <laughs> but that that's the deviousness of the system to get into the mutant academy thing one concept that I, i'm gonna pull this out right now actually just this book the invisibles so this comic series this is one of the dopest grant morrison this is one of the dopest like early 90s comic series that was ever written that was actually shown to me by uh dj vita um that used to uh go by i, I don't know which name uh they go by now but uh used to go by ryan Rapusa. So DJ Advaita was one of their names and this beat maker that I've worked with that I made a couple different tra uh, tracks with, including Transparent Hood and one of the tracks off of Sekmet, Past, Present, and Future. And I, we made a couple other, I think we're working on another project of Mutant Warfare, uh, upcoming Mutant Academy album. But so they are the ones who introduced me to that because I remember one day somebody was like, wouldn't it be cool if we had like a superhero comic that wasn't about superheroes and didn't support corporate America and they were actually fighting against the system and like CIA agents and all this shit. And Advaita popped up and was like, yo, it does exist. It's called The Invisibles. Check it out. Mm. And so I did. It took me like a year, I think, to even find it at a random bookstore. And I found the first volume. And when I read it, I was like engrossed. Like I, I couldn't stop reading it because it explains all of it. it. Like it deconstructs religion, like, you know, oppression, like even... The entire book doesn't, I'm sure, because for mainstream purposes, because that's like a really famous writer, he knew or they knew that if they um, expressed it in that way about animal activism in a very direct way, it probably wouldn't be mainstream published. Okay, shit, it's saying my battery is weak, so I don't know how much time I have left. But, but essentially, that I would recommend that more than any other comic book. I would say check out the Invisible series. There's a free link for the whole download plus the comic reader on Revolt Motion. But also I'd encourage you, if you can get it at a secondhand store or even on discount somewhere, that's probably the only commercial purchase I would encourage people to make an exception <laughs> for in terms of books. Sometimes exceptions can be made at a good bookstore. Right. That series is unreal. It talks about the archons, about the Gnostics, the conspiracy theories of time, uh, nonlinear time, past, present, future, conspiracy theories like uh, indigenous wisdom, uh, queer theory, Half the characters are queer, um, you know, misfits, disenfranchised, homeless, um, like complete anti-heroes, rebels, anarchists, right. and it's unreal. But anyways, Mute Academy, I would say, like really is trying to teach essentially what you were saying, like everything we've talked about here right now, that is Mute Academy. And also, you know, herbalism, everything that they don't teach in school, how to deconstruct the system, but also how to function within it and be able to sustainably live in and out of it. Whether you're hopping in the matrix to try to you know, subvert ideologies, play trickster, and then go back to where you need to recharge, or you're learning to live completely off grid and how to build tomorrow's society. Every academy, none of them are, you know, managed as an umbrella term, like, like you were saying, or like even as like, oh, this is the overseeing academy. None of them, all of them are independent and all of them are managed, you know, in the community sense, but also by uh, different specific focuses in areas, whether it's yoga or herbalism or some places are more focused on music or 
over there, obviously, it's going to be a lot more on sustainability and herbalism, but we're also going to have a music studio by next um, uh, next spring. Hopefully, I have it right here. So the Nikita Degwak Academy is much more for like artists and residents type uh, space. It's bigger. I co-purchased this with my mother like about 10 years ago, and it's gone up quite a bit. It's on an acre of land uh, outside a couple of hours outside of Montreal. I've been like finished renovating here. It's about 32, uh, 3,200 square feet. Um, and it's got probably like 600 different types of plants and everything. The other ones are much bigger, much more off-grid in the uh, Quebec province and the Gaspésia region, around like a thousand kilometer radius along line the Appalachians. Uh, and I'll put more information on that and update Revolt Motion uh, soon for that. So I would encourage people to check that out again. So yeah, please, question. Yeah, yeah. Just, uh, I, would, I would love to hear just a, a word about the philosophy of Revolt Motion because I, I tell everybody about it and the, the general framework and the whole idea of nonprofit free culture. And um, again, to me, like I would say that some of the biggest inspirations to me were like anarchists, you know, anarcho-communists, uh, uh, basically I tell people like do it yourself, like artists and people like, like, you know, I gotta give a shout out to Tester Logic and like, you know, uh, Lee Reed and uh, there's some of the biggest like Intikana and Truth, the Truth Nonconformist Movement, Ali Dehesh, like all those people that were like hardline, like frontline activists, indigenous activists, like intersectional activists that, you know, are against the government, but also peaceable, not necessarily peaceful, but, um, you know, that are militant as well for indigenous rights, for everything else. So the, um, I would say that the, the, the foundation for Revolt Motion is very similar to Mutant Academy, but Mutant Academy ended up being underneath Revolt Motion, when in reality it could be the other way around. Revolt Motion is kind of just an intersectional a hub of all kinds of different resources and information from, you know, myths, forgotten myths and Gnosticism to like occult literature uh, and, and portals. Essentially, it's like never ending portals to other portals to other portals on the internet, to all kinds of stuff that you would usually maybe find on the dark web, but, uh, and not in the, you know, in the violent or like weird sense, but in the sense of like, you know, um, anti-colonial, anti-systemic, like subverted. Uh, and a lot of that information now that's left there has been blotted out from other websites that disappeared and shit like that, but that I kept on hard drive and re-uploaded like some of the Gnostic myths about Sophia or uh, which I've re-edited or some interviews, banned TEDx talks. There's a lot of stuff that has traditional academic, you know, conventional or non-conventional activist academic stuff on there to kind of explain it in a credible way for people who are skeptical about that. But also there's, you know, Rasta's talking about herbalism in the orthomolecular and ITEL living section. There's stuff about floating and, um, you know, martial arts, um, animal activism, sentient activism, uh, poetry, futurism, the Venus Project, um, uh, rainbow prophecies, uh, the Hopi prophecies, the rainbow tribes, uh, queer culture. It's, it's a mix and match of, of as much information as possible, really. And the, the nonprofit aspect to me comes from the fact that money, fiat currency is an illusion. We all know the banks, like they've actually come out in the UK recently and said that they don't even, they print money according to demand. They don't have anything backing it up. Right. Most people have known that for a long time, which is why crypto is rising and the banks have been falling. Right. If everybody knew that logically right now, I've just convinced my mom to pull out her retirement savings to actually, and which was practically, this is very little, it was like a hundred and some thousand. And she owes more than that to the bank right now, but she was like, no, no, I'll leave it there because when like 10 years from now, I should have like, I'm like, you don't even know if the banks will be there one year from now, even 10 years from now, she didn't even know that they have no obligation to give you back that money in a lump sum. They can still heavily tax you for it. So you can't, they, 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 everything they do is complete extortion and it's based off of nothing while they profit immensely. So what I would encourage people to do honestly is whatever money you have in the bank, pull it out, Invest in land, go look it up online, invest in land, whether it's like just straight land or off, off grid land, even if it's a little piece of like an acre, two acres, you'd be amazed. Like in, in the Matapedia region, the amount of land that she was able to get for a hundred and, and, and was like almost 280 acres with two cottages. So for like. All right. Well, um, I guess we lost them. Um, so. I literally had so many questions <laughs> that I did not get to ask. So I'm going to message him and see if I can get him back on the line, see if I can get him back on a different device. But uh, as you can all see, uh, this uh, is a magical person. <laughs> oh, wellspring of subversive information <laughs> and uh, radical, uh, nonlinear, off the walls, out of control ideas that uh, it's amazing to me that he got a PhD in this system. Um, like considering how, you know, compartmentalized and regimented academia is that someone that is that 
you know, transdisciplinary and, and transgressive, um, was able to get through that institution. And I really look forward to seeing what he does in the future with it. Um, because there's just so much there and he has so much, I, I'm so, I'm going to try to get him back on the line because I just had so many questions that I didn't get to ask. So I'm going <laughs> to try to get him back on. So wish me luck. Right. <laughs> totally. Well, yeah, it's all good. Uh, me too. Uh, we're now working on uh, the man's clock, uh, whatever, as they say. <laughs> that, that's a good that's a good analogy i like that <laughs> good analogy really but yeah so yeah for this last section i uh, especially wanted to talk to you about something that you know is the most fascinating subjects to me uh, which is religion and you know as a religious studies scholar i would love to hear some of your perspective on the nature of this apocalypse that we're living through because it, my understanding is that a lot of different traditions have this end times prophecy or, or this at least you know an idea of that some major transformation is going to take place and so i was wondering what your interpretation of what the nature of that it, of that transformation is i i like how um, how precisely you worded that that's very good and i'd like to like as much as like and i i am like a self-professed religious studies scholar and i am like you know i have written uh, most of my postdoctoral thesis on that years ago already and I'm still I've been doing research even before I came into academia I've been doing research since my you know even early teen and childhood years into that and I you know you, you know this already but uh, for the other people that didn't know or that haven't read about that uh, I was I was forced into like uh, you know like essentially what I, I would call the, you know and obviously like no trivialization or disrespect intended to like the full extent of the horrors of, of, of uh, you know, residential schooling, but very much this system is still a neo-residential system, but even more so in that sense compared to these schools. Now, the school I went to was a, a like a Catholic nun-run all-male boarding school, which force-fed us a, a lot more than just the, the, the bullshit food full of like, you know, uh, or, and like forced religion upon us, forced us to go to church, which was built into the school every day, forced interpretations of demonizations of Native people, told me I was like a child of the devil because I wrote with my left hand and I challenged the teachers. I, I still remember like with, and I, I took all of that with a lot of a grin. Like I was like literally the, the school reject there with like another kid there who was occasionally friends with me when nobody else looked at me who had like really thick glasses and everybody made fun of him for that and made fun of me for pretty much everything else from like my big ears to my big lips to my weird name to the food that my dad and my mom gave me going to school, which was like, you know, like, like traditional Middle Eastern food. Like back then my mom used to make her own like plain yogurt and give me dried dates and like for like dried fruits, like, um, like, like apricots and other stuff. And kids were like trading like chips and ramen. And I remember I just wanted white bread and ramen. And I was like, mom, why do we eat these ancient grain breads? And like, why am I, why do I get these healthy, like dried fruits and dried bananas and like, you know, homemade yogurt? Why am I wearing cheap clothes that you made out of like recycled like you know um um and she would make me like like custom clothes because she she sewed almost all of my clothes and she'd make them out of like leftover fabric from like torn window curtains or like shit like that and i was like and she ironically like you know this again too but and some other people might might not but you know she was very much anti-religion anti-patriarchy very much like in, indigenous in that but but some uh, or metis in that sense no, she's non-status because she never wanted to, to, you know, claim that in one way or another and didn't want anybody to, to misperceive that as, as being, you know, her goal towards, like, and nowadays you see a lot of people like, like Asak Murdoch, who's like a friend of mine, one of my favorite, like, Native activists in Canada, um, you know, uh, male-bodied Native activists in Canada. He's, um, you know, an, an artist, artivist, intersectional activist. He was saying recently, you know, he was encouraging people, anyone who's status native, he said, cut up your status card, post it on Facebook, and I'll send you a free painting. And I love that. I think it's amazing because the whole idea of status and non-status, not to discredit people that have, like, obviously it's amazing to have, like, you know, full-blooded native bloodlines. That's something to be very proud of. But that has nothing to do with the government legislating who actually gets to be full status native or not. Because then at the end of the day, you end up with people that have you know 
what would be considered non-status to indigenous people but have a status card considering them full status and don't practice indigenous ways or you know uh, are completely either christianized or colonized but they claim and that those are the same people that right-wing fundamentalists and extremists and other people that are dissidents of native culture will use an example and be like oh look at this chief they're corrupted they built a pipeline and this and that and somebody will be like yeah well their status and it's like that person according to indigenous standards is not an indigenous person regardless of whether or not their bloodlines are quote unquote 100 percent indigenous certified by a colonial government they're not an indigenous person if they're destroying and raping the land or they're practicing you know uh christianized white supremacist culture or it's the same thing with africans or asian people or anything else and this is the confusing thing about this inversion which is part of the apocalypse because it's kind of a you know the the, the question you're, you're asking is that a lot of what they mention in many of those different scriptures from hinduism to christianity to everything is that in, in, at the end of days or in these end times which are two different concepts but they're related in a sense um what happens is there's an inversion there's not only just a cultural inversion and a linguistic inversion and a hegemonic inversion and like a patriarchal to matriarchal inversion in it so that this idea of the great shift which is one of the albums that i wrote recently but also a concept that you know was inspired by chaos way back in the days where he dropped uh the first his first album in superstar part zero uh that single that was like really really famous where in the beginning of it in the intro he said uh, something like uh, Oh, I, I forget. He's like, he's like, people of planet Earth are tired. Um, and I forget the quote unquote, like there's kind of a bracket after that. But then essentially he was like saying that, what's, what's the exact quote again? He said, um, in an effort to aid the great shift, myriads of light bodies incarnate to rock mics. And then he starts spinning like complex, this hip hop alchemy. When I was a kid, I went to record companies. And my apologies to chaos for like the jumbling and, and misquoting of that. Cause I don't read, it's been probably like a decade since I've heard that song. But it's stuck in my mind, this idea of the great shift and everything inverting back to what it was originally meant to be with paganism, with matriarchy, with indigeneity, with animism. And that's this idea that now science is false science, that freedom is slavery, this new speak from like 1984. So, and that even in Hinduism, when they say in that age, in the age of 80 sins that, you know, in so-called Kali Yuga, which again is part of the inversion, because this concept that it's the age of the angry goddess, when in reality, it's, I would, I, like I've often called it Vaisha Yuga, which is the age of the corrupted merchants. It's not even the age of the merchants themselves, because they're not even real merchants. Just like when people are like, oh, Jewish people will control the world and the media. It's like, those aren't Jewish people. They're hiding behind fake notions of Zionism and, and Judaism, which are corrupted and have nothing to do. It's like calling Donald Trump a Christian and being like those fucking Christians. And it's like, Yo, Christians are Rastafarian, Ital, like, you know, vegans that live in harmony with the earth. And I'm, if people were even following a fraction of what Yeshua was saying, it's like, yo, you would have no possessions. You would forsake your friends and your family if they went again any, against any of the fundamental principles that, you know, spirituality actually entails. No yogi would ever be sitting with a Lululemon slave labor mat or whatever else, like shit from rubber that was imported from Africa and processed and, and, and spandex stretches and like drinking a Starbucks latte with a shot of rape juice in it, like I said, and some other, it's like, none of that shit is yoga. The fundamental principles of Patanjali and yoga, the eight limbs of yoga, like it's like the, the most basic out of all of those that everything else emanates from like Harris one with knowledge and, and hip hop culture without which you have no hip hop culture is ahimsa which is non-violence and then a lot of people are like yeah so ahimsa so stop being violent stop being an activist don't uh, be compassionate towards people i'm like yo that's like a white supremacist being told that they're racist and they're burning black people and they're like shut up you're oppressing me stop being violent stop being oppressive i'm like you being reminded that you're being genocidal and, and destructive and colonial is not violence like that is ahimsa ahimsa is activism but it's doing it in a in a way which raises awareness is, oh, these days everything seems to have been again like this this cultural this religious and this this hegemonic inversion it kind of entails that people think that pacifism is the answer to everything when and pacifism is, is great you know you need that opposition just like you need the atlantic and the pacific ocean just like you need atlantis and the Maria, but like you can't just have pacifism demonizing activism and activism demonizing pacifism and then it's like this whole divide and conquer 
And yeah, like I was saying, in Hinduism, in the age of 80 sins, which they say is Kali Yuga, which is actually Vaisha Yuga. Somebody else said that, you know, Kali is actually, it's another uh, meaning for that, which is a misinterpretation, which means, you know, coming from the root Kal, which is like darkness or dirt or like, you know, um, which the same as Kalki, which actually means dirt of the earth, but um, which many people think is like, um, you know, this, this great title. And at the end of the day, even when I had that name, which I didn't choose and which I didn't believe that I represented other than in a metaphorical or linguistic sense as a hip hop artist, it's an avatar of an avatar of a divinity who is an incarnation that was created by a goddess who is also part of a greater cosmos. So at the end of the day, people think that it's a great, and it still has a lot of ego in, intended it, but it's not what people perceive it to be. It, it literally just means a person who is the dirt of the earth or the scourge of the earth. So, yeah, so that, that concept, some people were like, oh, it means the cleanser of darkness or something. Kali Yuga means the dark ages. And I'm like, but then you're associating darkness with evil. And Kali, the goddess, who also has the same name with evil. Just like people saying black magic. But I, I don't mean not to be racist or like, oh, it's a dark day. And, a, and it's like, but it unintentionally is. It's a form of photonic phobia. It's a form of like an inversion of... of you know, uh, the, the concept that the white light and purity and everything, which I talk a lot about as well, and which Karis one really, really inspired in many different ways with this concept of endarkenment, even though I've talked about that my, like a lot of my life. But in earlier music, you can tell I had more, I was still talking about the demonization of darkness, but I was also idealizing light in many other ways, which I would say is, is acceptable if you're showing the other side of it. But if you're constantly saying shit that's patriarchal or people like being you know, like, oh, God, God doesn't have a gender. I'm like, that's like you saying, I mean, man, I'm saying man, but really, I mean, woman and queer and everything, but I'm just going to use the word man, and it doesn't have a gender. I'm like, linguistically, what you're saying is completely inaccurate. Any student in high school in fucking English could be like, I'm sorry, man has a gender, woman has a gender, God has a gender, goddess has a gender. If you want to use a non-gendered term, you've got a whole plethora of them. You could say most high. You can say... Even creator technically is gendered as well, but it, it's less gendered than God is. And so, and, and people are like, yeah, I, well, I use those words. I'm like, then why don't you use it all the time? Why do you insist on using a word that's always associated with father in scriptures that were written by men and that are inherently patriarchal and queerphobic and misogynistic? And then claiming that none of that shit is real and it's all a misinterpretation and a mistranslation. I'm like, no, it isn't. Even if it's part of an inversion, and I do believe that there is an original version of some kind of Bible and Torah, like like some, you know, like, um, I think it was Michael Dronin or something that wrote a book about the, the Bible code, which was based on the Torah and this original Torah that, you know, was written by aliens uh, on sapphire tablets. I believe that exists and that it would be inherently matriarchal and very mystical. The point is we don't have that version on Earth right now. We don't know where it is. So regardless of people saying the Quran is mathematically perfect, I'm like, I'm sure it is in some density somewhere. But then you realize that was written by like 50 some density, like, you know, matriarchal beings. And the version of that that you think is the perfect version that you have, the only surah that actually had directly to do with that has been banned as being demonic, even though they say the Quran was never changed. And then they debate that historically. But I'm like, then why do you have a bunch of random words in there? And I don't even speak Arabic, but studying it for like, you know, it's part of my culture, it's part of my heritage, like genetically, but nobody taught it to me and I didn't grow up in those regions. So even studying it for like a, a day or two when I was writing um, that, that song uh, off the last album, I, I wrote for Ali on, on her father, on their father's beats, uh, Ghost of the Machine, the eighth track, like the shamanic rights track, uh, when I dropped that, the Surah uh, 51 from the Quran, but like with the original Surah, the way I believe in, and many other scholars believe it was written, and, and even many matriarchal Muslims and, and, you know, activist Muslims believe, and Sufis and, and Sikhs and a bunch of other people, that, that Surah originally and many other words in other Surahs are encrypted in a way where the translation has been specifically made into a male word and they constantly refer to it as Allah but if you look at that and I forget the exact word now but it's in one of those other tracks and my apologies to people from my memory like I said I don't speak Arabic but there are many other words in the Quran which are denoting uh, in the English translation a version of God which is translated as a male name and some people say it's just for convenience but I'm like yeah okay that, that's convenient to say that it just happens to be that way 
But then also those words in the original Arabic are actually common female names. So if that's the case, imagine that you had a Bible where it says, and the father said, but then you look at the original in Aramaic and in Hebrew and in Greek, and you know, and suddenly you realize those words are actually say, um, I don't know, it's not, it's not Yahweh, it's like Sophia, or it's like a name which is commonly associated, which is exactly what the Gnostics worship, you know, the, the goddess is Sophia who created God, this, this false God who's an archonic overlord, the Demiurge, who became essentially delusional and psychopathic and was really, really angry at his mom, like a, you know, like a bratty teenage rebellious son in a sense, which I can relate to because I've, I've been like that a lot of my life. And I think a lot of teenagers and rebellion against mother figures and other situations like that. I mean, who knows what the real story is, but that in a sense, I, I believe is the root of what created that inversion and that confusion. Uh, which is like angry males who got into a violent, um, oppressive relationship, either with mother figures or with uh, relationship figures. And again, I can relate to that. I've been far from a perfect person. I'm not a violent person. I'm not even a verbally violent person in the traditional sense of the term. I haven't ever called a woman bitch, I think, other than the Queen of England. Um, you know, but still, I can relate to the anger and the frustration of being trapped in that patriarchal system which reinforces a toxic masculinity where a lot of unconscious behaviors get perpetuated through that without you even wanting it, especially the irony of wanting to fight against the system where you become victimized by the very beings that are angry at you for demonizing them and so they manipulate you in some kind of devious way into becoming the stereotype that you don't want to be so that they can discredit what you're doing as being similar to what they're trying to deny that they're responsible for. So it, it, that's, that's a really convoluted way to express it, but essentially the truth is simple. And it, like I said, these languages, these colonial languages and the realities that we express and the way that we're meant to express them. And after, you know, 25 years in academia, this is what happens. I'm trying to explain a super simple concept, but I have to use all these convoluted words and, and you know, complex interpretations that for some people require a fucking dictionary or some other shit to look through where at the end of the day, I could just say, well, this is what happened. Um, a really angry alien male got frustrated with his mom and then with his girlfriend and then he denied that he did anything wrong and then he became a huge dictator and he took over the entire cosmos and rewrote history and turned it into um, a demonization of anyone who didn't agree with him. And we're still battling that to this day. And the end of days and the great shift is when people finally realize how fucking stupid this whole shit is and it's a lifting of the veil, which is literally what apocalypse means. Like in Son of Saturn's uh, Apotheosis, one of the quotes on that album was about that. It's about the lifting of the veil. A lot of people know that, a lot of religious scholars, but most people don't realize. And like um, E.T., Eternal Turbulence, um, from a warrior-type wizard said recently uh, on one of the tracks that we did together, I think it was a loose circular with Bliss and with, I forget, Rev someone else, and uh, I believe maybe even uh, Brown Machabi uh, from Pillars of Enlightenment was on there as well. I, I forget now. There was, oh, I think I'm lying, sir, as well, from Germany. It was, it was a really dope track, but one of the samples on there was like, uh, and, and what Eternal Turbulence was talking about is how the lifting of the veil was, it, 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 so Apocalypse has this dual meaning within a binary reality of good and evil, where if you happen to be perpetuating these genocidal and, and unconscious and, and abusive tendencies on a regular basis and you're denying it, then Apocalypse to you will be destruction and you know, judgment and reckoning. But if you simply had no awareness of these unconscious behaviors, then that lifting of the veil means you have a realization, you have a revelation, and suddenly you change and you shift, and that's what the great shift is. But then a lot of people want to sit there and make up complicated explanations for, you know, very simple, unsustainable behaviors that they've been ignoring. And I get that, because we're, I don't think most human beings, and that's why I believe in concepts like Amnesty International, even like very um, directly, is that as, as simple as we are in a sense as humans and as unaware as we are in these flesh vessels that have barely been born, who knows if we're even trapped in some holographic projection like the idea of the holographic universe, which is pretty common scientifically now. We don't even know how long we've been alive, let alone how real this reality is or what the misperceptions are about it or what any of the fundamental notions we've been taught, um, you know, should or shouldn't be. So 
this idea of, of apocalypse can be very polymorphic. It can represent a lot of different realities. So I don't believe that human beings are largely responsible on a conscious or on a super conscious level for unconscious behaviors that have been systemically structured in a reality which, as Buddha and as many other beings have said, is permeated with unavoidable suffering. And so if all you can do is minimize the suffering and minimize the slavery, but you're constantly responsible, then you can see how, you know, a religious maniac overlord who structured this reality to be corrupted in that sense could force everybody to believe that they're all sinners and they're all hopeless. And the only way that they could ever be redeemed is by bowing down to this supreme overlord, because it's like, no matter what you do, you're breathing in, you know, trillions of creatures of sentience every second. You're breathing in air. You're destroying, you know, insects when you walk around. You're so being conscious on that level, even for a Buddhist monk or a Jain scholar or nun or, you know, is practically impossible. You're constantly going to cause suffering. So I can see how, and this is why it's so important for pacifists and activists to align. And, and that's what I love about anarchy and about communism and about, you know, not the historical applied principles, but the ideologies. Because people are like, well, capitalism, communism, they're, they're both, they were both completely fucked up. Some people argue communism caused even more deaths. I'm like, yeah, Mao caused, well, who knows, anywhere between 20 to 80 million deaths, like directly and indirectly, which is worse than Hitler. But the point is, it's not, that's not, because that's like saying that, you know, Trump or Obama or anyone else or some other person uh, represents that just because they misperceived certain notions or because they misapplied certain realities that somehow that's what communism is. No. And capitalism is inherently flawed at its basis because it's, it's based on a hierarchical structure which privileges certain people over certain other. Communism at its basis theoretically is different. Both of them were applied horribly historically. But a lot of people are like, well, capitalism could be, fun it can not ever be functional without actually oppressing certain people. It functions off. And, and once you have a high enough, you know, level of awareness and, and education, not necessarily systemically or, or you know, institutionally, but just in general, you realize that because you're like, oh, right. You know, the whole concept of getting cheap labor and goods and, and imported foods and, and clothes and all of this stuff at this, you know, uh, discounted price and making all this money, sustaining an industry, which is largely built on 95% of exploitation and destruction, even outside of an ideal, you know, Buddhist structure of a society that would be perfect, that still would cause some form of suffering you realize that there is no way that capitalism could ever be ideally functional without oppressing people. So even communism, like, because the, the nature, this is why I love, you know, people like, like Derrida, for example, who's a, you know, created deconstructivism. And so that idea of deconstructing everything to me is like decolonizing or, you know, deprogramming, um, hacking. It's like you're taking apart everything, analyzing it, not just analyzing it, but like, you know, you can pull it apart until you have a blank construct and all these different elements that are apart from the construct and then you re-piece it together just like all these different colors from right. say painting that you've recycled and pulled out the pigments from and then you remeld them into new pigments and mix it with other medicines and plants and whatever else it is and then you recreate you repurpose you you know reuse but if these days everything is is oh, toss it away and like Akhenaten was like a one of my favorite French, old school French hip hop artist, one of the founders of, of you know, the French hip hop movement in Marseille, which was very much like Quebec was to, um, you know, the rest of French Canadian culture in a sense was very much apart from it. He has this track where uh, he says, uh, I think it's off Domaine saint Wayne, which means uh, with him and Shuriken, who are both like some of my greatest inspirations since way back in the days, like back in the days of Keras one and a bunch of other people. Um, so, you know, I am Imperial Asiatic Men was their, their original moniker. Uh, they did some shit with Wu-Tang and a bunch of other people. But, uh, but yeah, on that track, he says on Demain C'est Loin, which means tomorrow is far away. He says, Les élus ressassent rénovation, ça rassure, mais c'est toujours la, la même merde derrière la dernière couche de peinture. So he's saying the elected people are always, you know, re, they're always rehashing, literally. They're always rehashing notions of renovation. And it reassures people, but it's always the same shit behind the last coat of paint. And so I love that idea because the whole point is when, when people see like, oh, the paint's peeling, there's mold on the wall or there's this, let's just paint it over. But then it's like more toxic shit, more stuff. And then, and then people wonder why, 
you go like nuts being inside and why you get manipulated when you're in a house that's surrounded even when the paint dries and it doesn't smell toxic anymore it should tell you something that you can't be in a house when it's being painted because you could die so i mean even if it's safe after that once it's dried i mean why would you want to put toxic shit that you can die from or dishwasher liquid or anything that's like do not swallow go to a poison center so why the fuck would you put that on the shit that you eat your food off of or clean your floors or anything with products that can cause cancer and disease and like all of it the toothpaste like everything else is like don't swallow this don't do that but it's okay to put it in your mouth i'm like <laughs> you fucking absorb like how much of that shit same with makeup same with so me being here in the past like month and a half on and off because i've been traveling back to edmonton backing up the studio dropping by toronto to like link up with tester logic and see picking up some cbd uh, you know, finishing up the album with with him and Marley. That's gonna be. Um, I'm not too sure what we're gonna call it yet, but we're tossing around some ideas, like something like Fuera del Tiempo, or like uh, This Tiempo, like either Exiles, Time Travelers, something like that. But like a dead, like a bilingual title. That one too is gonna be a lot more, I think, accessible because Marley um, uh, Revel singing on that is gonna be actually like a really dope mix of like you know, like uh, Marley is very much like a, an African activist and like very much like a like like hardcore to sexual activist as well and feminist and, and queer theorist. And um, C is like 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 you know hardcore indigenous anarchist activist who's part of the Beehive Collective. You know he was wanted by CSIS for a while. They tried charging him and like splitting them up and 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 saying he was conspiring against the Canadian government and like you know uh, uh, inciting uh, riots and like police violence uh, because like you know he had. The, pictures that people look up test their logic and you look up like uh democracy's bankrupt or like um what's the other one conspiracy rap they actually have footage of one of the riots that they caused at one of their shows and the cops uh you know being like molotov cocktails being thrown at cop cars and like people rocking the cop cars and shit and they're like but the point is he's a fucking yoga teacher and he's a herbalist and like he doesn't have a criminal record but he makes you know militant music and, and of course he would be militant in a situation of abuse and, and he has been and he's at like all kinds of indigenous protests and like you know g20 summit like g7 like every everything you can think of they've been all across the americas and, and protesting and teaching about that and if anyone wants to look that up to beehive uh, beehivecollective.org all the free posters it's all creative commons you can download the full posters you can order it from them they're very cheap, like posters are on a sliding scale according to your budget, like anywhere from 10 to like $40 for giant double-sided high definition posters that come with little pamphlets explaining all the different like exploitations of mining with like mountaintop removal in the Appalachians. Uh, I copped like all their posters the first show I went there and I toured with them for a bit and I've been re-inviting them throughout the, the times. But basically, so people like that, you know, when I link up with people like that, that's the main reason I became who I am now. People like that, like in Tikana, like Ali Yahesh, like Unknown Misery, Babylon War Child, like the, the whole crew like that, Son of Saturn. People that were so strangely and oddly intersectional in ways that people wouldn't even expect. You know, like, like someone who was this hard, hardcore enough that like, you know, the, the Canadian equivalent of the CIA wants to fucking charge you with, with you know, conspiracy against the government and, 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 and indicting like violence against police. Where in the states you, you could face fucking you know 25 to life for that or some other crazy shit get shot or kidnapped here they can't do shit to him because he's a pillar in the community like he's like an indigenous activist like you know he's a yoga teacher he's a herbalist he owns his own cannabis kombucha company like organic cannabis kombucha company turmeric ginger cbd thc uh, it's called cannabucha which and i mean uh, i'm i'm it's not like I'm trying to plug out. I don't get paid to say this, but I mean, that's medicinal remedies. Like, I know who he gets that from. I've drank that. I've like, it's amazing stuff. And, you know, he's got all kinds of different herbal knowledge. He grows his own garden. He's an MMA trainer as well. Um, and a Thai massage therapist. So it's like, that shit to me is amazing. Those are the people, people like you, like you know, the first time I met you, I was like, yo, like the, the, the amount of like intersectionality, your unapologetic nature, and yet like how like peaceable but also how militant you can be at the same time that's an inspiration because the number of times i've gone psychotic and ended up in horrible situations because i can't control my anger or i end up venting on the wrong people because i couldn't stand up to the other people that i should have said that shit to that's like the story of a lot of people's i think frustration and anger and yeah anyways i, I went on a, like a huge tangent on that but essentially um 
that to me, the, 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 to go back to your original question, the idea of like the apocalypse, what it means, and I've written that, I think, in, in part of the book that I'm working on, like the psychosocial, like the, the, the rewriting of Anarchist Primer to the End of the World as We Know It, um, you know, which is the subtitle is the same as the original uh, Jedi Mind Tricks album, Psychosocial Biochemical and Electromagnetic Manipulation of Consciousness. I just took out the human part there because it's all consciousness being manipulated, really. On some level, anyways, like even with awareness comes a, a level of the awareness that you're still being manipulated, but trying to minimize that. Just like so. <laughs> and so I mentioned in that the, the idea of the apocalypse, the end of the world is right now. The, the apocalypse is always right now because it's always lifting the veil of every misconception. It's constant evolution. So there is no the apocalypse is going to come on this date on 2012. There are great momentous events happening in microcosms and in macrocosms like world wars, like disasters, like all of that. But the point is that, like, say to someone who has a tsunami in their village where everything gets wiped out and suddenly their culture, that's the apocalypse to them very literally. And of course that's triggered through, you know, like I called it, I think in one of the tracks, is like evil acupuncture being done. Like when they're drilling a hole somewhere on there, some shit squirts out at the other side of the planet, they're not explaining that logically to people. They're like, oh, it's regrettable. This uh, tsunami just hit in a... But we know, like, people know about the, you know, the weather control, like HARP and all the other shit. It's not even just about directly using machines to do that, but even the drilling in oil pockets where you're removing this oil pocket, which is almost like a natural suspension for the earth to control itself. And then you expect tectonic plates not to shift and cause earthquakes and other... It's like this giant Jenga jigsaw puzzle where you pull out shit and suddenly it falls and smashes on the other side. And you're like, oh, it's, it's nuts. Like, it's like, yo, and it's right in front of our eyes, right? This is how they, they've gotten away with it every single time in the past. Because when it gets to the point where people are like, hey, I didn't know Roundup caused fucking cancer and chemical burns and, and this shit was doing that. And this company was, you're like, oh, you didn't read the article. Well, yeah, we did a piece on CNN like five days ago or whatever, or, oh, that, that research was published at this, and there's so much fucking information that when they come out later on, that's their due diligence, right? They're like, like recently on, I think on CNN and on Fox, they were talking about how, you know, General Mills had like some fucking Monsanto chemical in their, in their cereal or some other shit. And they're like, yeah, so, you know, that shit could cause cancer and blah, blah, blah. Then after that, when somebody's like, fuck, well, I've been feeding that to my kids for 15 years. Like, what the fuck? And then they start flipping out. They become paranoid. And, and, you know, then they're like, well, we told you, right? We didn't know this. We just did research saying like, and to me, that is the apocalypse as well. Because when people wake up to that realization and suddenly they look around and they're in a food desert or they're in a place where they feel like every choice is unsustainable and everything they've got is potentially toxic. A lot of people, they, you know, they become, I mean, understandably sickened or afraid or paranoid about, and then of course somebody you know, it's like, well, 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 calm down, calm down, take this medication. And it's like, that's poison too. All of this shit is like, so it's, it seems like it's an inescapable system, which is why to me, deconstructivism and realizing that the dream is realer than the reality and, and, and the reality is actually our dreams. You, this inversion, which they've pulled on us, we just have to flip it back around, which is exactly what hip hop does. That's exactly what Keras one talks about in terms of like, you know, anti-colonially repurposing colonial languages, you know, using slang words like wicked and sick and shit and, you know, fuck and the N word and a bunch of other shit in an opposite sense. That's all we can really do in a, in a, on a basic sustainable level. To shift it around it's like if you can't relearn to academically or scientifically or biologically deconstruct all of that shit use it against it if you know you've been poisoned by chemicals turn it into a fucking mutant story or a superhero story it's like you're like oh shit i'm like look at the bugs right look at the insects now that resist all of these super fucking toxins and and, and pesticides that are supposed to kill them but they grow stronger and more resistant and more immune so that's what I said in another track, I think on, on polymorphic prophecies, where I was like, um, we're like insects with poisons and pesticides. We adapt to their sins and hexes and grow stronger and more resistant minds and bodies like centipede spinal knotties. So I, I believe in that too. But the point is we can't consciously buy into that system, continue to perpetuate torture and slavery and purchase toxic products and expect that to benefit us. But if you're trapped in a situation where there is no other option 
usually there always kind of is, but I mean like in situations of kind of extremism or you're like, okay, fuck, this is all I have right now. That's why occult knowledge and magic can be so powerful because it's like, yo, fuck that. I'm going to reuse that against the people who used it against me, which was the concept of plague monks and nuns in the first place. This idea of like the, the plague oracles, you know, that were the beings who used the, the sins of colonialism and the toxins and all of that to throw it back against them and emerge from the sewers and the grime with the rats and the, you know, the snakes and the misfits and the bacteria and all of the, the, the diseases that they don't want to see that they've been hiding and sweeping under the carpet. And it comes back out to haunt them and poison them, which to me is a lot like the invisibles that I was talking about earlier as well. But anyways, that, that, so that, that's how I see it is uh, the best way to describe that very literally would be for people, I would say, go listen to that song from Edon, um, who's like an American, like uh, kind of old new school hip hop artist, probably around the same time that I started as well. Um, you know, from the, that album, I think it's from the early, early 2000, 2001, 2002, something like that, The Beauty and the Beat. And the song called Beauty on there, the first half, first of all, is one of my favorite poets of all time, like so fucking brilliant, and just pays homage like mad to all the old school, like heads, you know, like just built on this most solid foundation, became one of the most creative poets, sampling the Beatles, making his own beats, like doing all kinds of crazy, very intersectional person, very creative person very much outside the boundaries of what condition, you know, conventional hip hop is considered to be. And um, this track, Beauty, the first half, very creatively interesting, and like the samples and everything was, was wonderful. But the second, it's, the first half is almost kind of like, um, like an artistic, very poetically evocative rendering of the magic and mythological reality of the hidden beauty of the world that we're missing. And, and he talks about, you know, exploring the world with the innocence of a kid age five and, and frolicking in the sand with the colony of ants. And he's like, my molecules expand. Well, I, I forget the, the whole track. Again, there's like bits and pieces that, that but again, that's the, I haven't listened to that in a while, but I grew up listening. I think the first time I heard that was like 18, 19, and I'm like 36 now. So, but it's still stuck with me. And I still re-listen to it randomly and I'll play it to other people because the second hand of the song, he talks literally about the deconstruction of this reality. And so it comes and the beat starts like trailing down into another beat and then suddenly it restarts. And again, like, uh, you know, to, if you don't ever hear this, my apologies if I'm misquoting any of it, but to the, to, to the little, to the best of my memory right now, what I can remember is he's like, you know, as the beat starts rebuilding into a different one on the second part, he's like, the numbers, they fall off the clock, midnight at the museum, Annapolis stolen out of a still life. Um, you see it, uh, appear in the mirror with no reflection a 0.5 appears on your shelf for half stepping scientists explain that they no longer know things a dog takes a shit on the floor and grows wings planets of the solar system now trade places great lakes evaporate and leave no traces the man with the mustache reveals the three aces the briefcase is open to expose shit music the thief hears the piece that is played and weeps to it it's not exactly that for that line but i'm like something and I forget, there's a bunch of other stuff after that. And then eventually at the end, it's like something along the lines of um, uh, the criminal disappears through an opening door marked beauty exiting the world forevermore or something like that. I, I forget, like, and, and again, my apologies for misquoting. Uh, I think most of it is like semi-accurate, but like essentially, so the idea is like he's literally describing what happens when reality falls apart. And scientists are sitting there and all of a sudden all these glitches and Mandela effects are happening on such a high level that nobody knows what the fuck is real anymore. And to me, that's one of the greatest hip hop and, and, and poetry and art pieces ever written. I mean, talk about synesthesia, listening to Edon's tracks, that whole album in general. So it's like a multi-faceted, fractal, synesthetic experience because you're like, what the fuck? Like, he's done shit that nobody else, or they've done shit that nobody else has ever really done in hip-hop, which is what hip-hop is supposed to be about. So to me, that's what I would leave it on in terms of hip-hop and apocalypse and even religious studies. I mean, we could study texts to death. So many of them have been corrupted. We don't even know what any of the originals are. I don't speak Sumerian. I've studied a bit of it, you know, but I don't speak. I studied the originals at the Jesuits College that I went to after that. Uh, I studied the originals in, in, in uh, you know, in Greek for the, the New Testament. I've studied a bit of the Hebrew and Aramaic, but I have no knowledge of that. I did like three years of Greek and Latin. So I've studied that and that's where my etymology basis is. But 
you know, again, that was forced onto me in a colonial construct, which I had no choice of at the time because I wasn't uh, of an age to be able to choose that. So I, I used that and I tried to flip it against. It was something that, you know, even Thompson Highway, uh, the Kiss of the Fur Queen, and like this Indigenous queer activist as well and writer, talks a lot about that as well and talks about um, their experience in residential school and like all this bullshit that they went through and their abuse, even sexual abuse and all kinds of other shit and uses this, you know, famous anti-colonial native humor just like Thomas King or like other people like, um, you know, um, uh, Maria Campbell and Half Breeder, like, you know, uh, The Search for April Raintree. Um, all these like books is like, that's one of the most beautiful aspects of native resilience and indigenous and, and Afro-Asiatic resilience in general is this idea of taking extreme horror and pain and suffering and looking at the colonizers and instead of being deathly afraid or ashamed or powerless, they look and they laugh. And then that person looks and they're like, what do you mean you're, you're not afraid? And there's so many Buddhist stories like that, like the story of Mahakala trying to destroy this little old man, you know, as this angry, powerful demon before he turns into a wrathful, you know, activist Kali Sattva. And the old man just looks at him and he's like, you can't do shit to me. I mean, he doesn't say it that way, but you know, like Mahakala is like, old oh, man, why are you standing there? He's, you know, um, and again, my apologies for really, um, you know, miss, miss speak. I don't speak Tibetan. I can't explain the original story the way that it should be, but the, the gist of it, the way that, you know, my, my, uh, my friend taught it to me and, and, uh, and many other Vajrayana, you know, practitioners like Fred Flowers, for example, from Saskatoon, who was one of the inspirations that, you know, got me walking barefoot originally, was one of the first barefoot people in Saskatoon to do that for like a decade, even at minus 40. It was like this very eccentric person who was very much down to earth, you know, and has this giant community house on an acreage where during the Plague Monks tour, he flew a uh, um, uh, Lama from Tibet for the first time to come do the opening ceremony for our show at his house. And he hosted us there with like, he had like, like countless ancient Buddhist statues and giant crystals everywhere, but everybody is welcome there. And it's like right on the edge of the river. And, and we, you know, didn't charge a dime for anything, fed everyone food, just like this super humble, awesome, but also like really, you know, weird eclectic person. But essentially people like that, you know, are the ones that inspired me to have a different perspective of like kind of um, a syncretic aspect of Buddhism or like a lot of, um, you know, a lot of different Rinpoches or, or, or Lamas would say the first step to being a good Buddhist, don't be a Buddhist. So this, that, that's the Zen cone, right? It's the paradox. A lot of people like, like Alan Watts or like other, other people would talk about stuff like that. Joseph Campbell, you know, who were great inspirations for me as well, especially like so someone like Campbell that I grew up reading books from. But the idea is that, is that, you know, like the Mahakala is like running around raping, pillaging, killing, destroying the village. And then he gets to this little old man at the temple and he's like, the old man is just standing there smirking at him. And Mahakala is like, why are you looking like that old man? I could snap you in half right now. And he's like, if I let you, what do you mean if I let you? Look at me, I hear a little. And he's like, no. He's like, I'm, I'm not. I decide when I die or what I do. He's like, I don't believe you can do anything to me that I don't will for myself. And there's great Qigong masters that have practiced the same principles which I, you know, I've started to study a bit of Qigong recently, and I'm like, I'm not even like a beginner. I did like probably like a couple of years of martial arts when I was like 10 years old. I've started retraining recently. I've done a lot more yoga recently. I've been doing like three, four, you know, um, hours of yoga a day, like, you know, 15, 20 like kilometers of walking, like doing a lot of heavy lifting and a bunch of other shit and trying to retrain myself um, to get back to that, to, to use the energy. But essentially, you know, uh, the idea of, that, that Qigong principle, which is like, if you're not, if you are interconnected with that being, if there is no fundamental difference that makes you opposite to any other being, which is a reflection of you, like the concept of in la kecha la kin, or, you know, omitaku yo yasin, or any of these indigenous sayings that express that we are all just different facets of each other reflected. Um, which it doesn't mean we're the same. Like we've talked about that before, but the idea of the, like this new age movement being like, um, and sorry, I should say this corrupted, like kind of Judeo-Christian whitewashed uh, and fake Judeo-Christian whitewashed, um, you know, Euro Western Eurocentric colonial version of new age, um, you know, theology, which is very heteropatriarchal and heteronormative also, and, and very justifying of colonialism and all kinds of other crap like that. 
of this idea that we're all the same, we're all one. No, we aren't. We're interconnected. We're all different. The difference in the diversity is the beauty of it. Right. You wouldn't want everyone to write the exact same poem and recite it in the exact same tone. I mean, even robots don't do that. They have variations. Artificial intelligence is only demonized and, and thought of the way that we do or insects or any other aspect of that, which to me are directly related because we misconceive and misunderstand the fundamental notion that they're even more enslaved than we are. So if we program them in a binary, static, non-upgrading version, um, you know, then they're completely trapped, just like this computer or like any other. That's why to me, when I was talking about the Reiki today, again, like that's, that's the other aspect I told you earlier. I was like, fuck, if I can recharge this computer and do the second part, hopefully, and it wouldn't work. And then again, I was like, oh, you know what? I didn't even, this time, I didn't even have to stretch my hand out. I had my hands together, like literally like this, and I started saying Kuan Yin mantras to like the, you know, the healing mantras to like the, the, the Bodhisattva of compassion and, and uh, mercy that I dedicated to me. Like that's the, that idea of like a, a, an Afro-Asiatic, and then I pray to like the indigenous Kuan Yin to me. Like I have a black mask of her that was given by a friend. I like this idea of like, like an indigenous Afro-Asiatic Kuan Yin which I've mentioned in a couple different uh, aspects because a lot of people pr pray to a white kind of a Kuan Yin that's Asiatic, but very fair skin, which is beautiful too. But she has 33 guises for a reason, which if you piece them together is like a double cell mitosis or like a butterfly spreading into double infinity. So, so the idea of 33 guises just represents infinity, just like the idea of Sufis spinning 33 times to reach ecstasy. So, you know, whirling dervishes, which incidentally, I, I did one of those sessions recently, one of my um, you know, like yoga teachers here was a friend of mine, did my first like whirling dervish ceremony with me and taught me that. And I didn't even realize, she was like, oh, telling everyone to start like really slowly. She's like, spin at whatever rate you want. And the last time I tried that, um, this was about a month ago. Last time I tried that randomly, because I've always been fascinated by that. And I consider myself, you know, in some senses, even though I can't obviously like, claim to be nobody can really say like it's like the buddhist don't be a buddhist like i'm not a sufi but i consider that i i am not just a christian and a, and a sikh and, and this and that. i i am and i'm not any of this just like some people are like are you a specialist are you a scholar are you this are you that yes and no so and people hate that they want a def definitive answer they want a one are you're either this or that you cannot and it's like saying well pick a favorite book you can't have two or three or five and it doesn't make sense. But anyways, I, I'm, I'm not going all over the place. But what I meant to say is that I didn't, until I, I she told me how to do it properly. And, and ironically, she's not a Sufi. And she was like telling the class, like, hey, we have like a, an urban Sufi who actually comes from like, who practices a lot of the principles that we're doing. So it's an honor to have you here today. Maybe, and I was able to explain some technical aspects of like the numerology and, and the symbolism of 720 and the completion of certain cycles, like the 33 spins or you know, aspects of, of the, the poetic nature of that cipher and, and what it creates when you're whirling and creating that vortex for yourself psychically and your spirit is escaping your body, just like the cipher of hip hop, which creates this, this vortex that sends you into another world through poetry and through, you know, linguistic creation, just like the, the Sapir Whorf hypothesis explains like how nature and, and reality, the nature of our reality is structured through language. So the more languages you speak and the more words you have to describe that the more emotions, the more your nature and your reality around you shifts. So the same for poetry, the same for Sufism. When you're spinning, you go into this, this portal. But I, the first time I tried that like a decade ago and I was like, oh, let me just try to spin. I got dizzy after like five spins and I fell on the ground and I was like, shit. And I think anyone who's tried as a kid to spin around, but then when she taught me the most basic principles again, which is super simple. She's just like, okay, so put one foot here and one foot there in this particular stance, you know, like not too far, not too close away. And then lift up your, I forget now if it's right or left hand. And it was like, look at, but you know, either way it's irrelevant. You can spin both ways and, and create different ciphers. But it was like, stare at one of your hands uplifted at a certain distance, but focus on this one focal point, just like in meditation. Don't keep your gaze away from that focal point on your hand. Like if you're looking at the palm of your hand, stare at it intently while you're spinning and don't lose that because that allows you to focus on that rather than on the whirling sensation of the illusory fabric of reality around you. And the other hand is, you know, halfway downwards, but on an opposite kind of balanced spectrum, like standing away so that you're kind of channeling the energy of the earth and balancing yourself like a pendulum in a sense so that you have this, this, you know, dual balance going on while you're spinning. And 
when she explained that to me and I started spinning slower and then faster and faster and faster, I was able to spin for like almost an hour straight for probably like 500 spins and just have all of these different, you know, realizations about my hand morphing into some alien hand and like all kinds of different seeing the, the blurring of everything around me in the room disappearing and, and time and space concepts distorting. And I was like, yo, it's not even complicated. And it's not because I'm gifted. It's because she explained it to me really simply. She's a brilliant teacher. Like she's just like a, you know, she's a Tai Chi teacher, Qigong teacher, yoga teacher. She teaches about like eight different types of yoga, Pilates, and she's like 21 years old. But again, she's like so open to those realities and so kind of unfettered by this idea that it must be complex to learn all of this, that she brings it back down to the basics and just has faith that it'll function, which in religion has been, you know, corrupted into dogmas and ideologies, which are supposed to be faithful, but really it's, it's not. It becomes like a, a, a slavish ignorance that's not based in prescience or intuition. It's imposed into dogmas. But anyways, that, that whole, I'm not even sure where I was going with all of that, but, but yeah. Yeah, that was, that was another question. That does lead into another question I, that I was going to ask is like, why is it that there's this chasm between the teachings of all the pro every prophet and all the religious organizations that pop up around them? Like, it seems like, you know, and I guess it kind of goes back to like what you were talking about, like with communism and how it got perverted and deteriorated into this authoritarian thing. But like Marx would have fucking hated that shit. Oh, yeah. Like, fuck yeah. <laughs> like... Marx would have said, like, you know, old, old track I wrote when I was like 19, I think on a suspect one beat, like a piece, piece of suspect one, if he's still out there rhyming, but um, it was like a Taino brethren of mine from the original League of Extraordinary MCs, which was kind of like the, the, the blueprint of Mute Academy way back in the days. It was started by St. Tala, uh, aka Port Equator Maine, who's an, uh, another Taino, like uh, Puerto Rican brethren, but um, queer, queer uh, activist, artist, intersectional, really amazing person too. We got into our own, like all of us had different ups and downs in, in our careers. And some of us quit completely for a while and then came back to hip hop. Other people went on, started families, did something totally different. But uh, it was really dope. And peace to Derelict, to Ashari the Vagabond. Like that's one of the most hardcore, like old school, uh, you know, intersectional, like gods and earths, but also like militant native Afro-American, um, you know, uh, like just, just grimy, you know, people's army, but also like very real, like grounded in spirituality and Hopi prophecies and traditions, but also very much streetwise and like beat maker, producer, um, you know, like performer, uh, MC, made probably about as many albums as I did. Like I'm like, I, I think honestly, Ashari must have about a hundred albums out there. He produced most of the beats for them. He's been rapping since like the early to mid eighties. Uh, doing this shit with no recognition, no money, never charged a dime for any of his albums or productions or any, like he's been living off of like nothing. And I remember the number of times Ashari was like, yo man, nobody even gives a fuck. I don't even know why I'm still doing this. And I was like, trust me, in other densities and other realities, it doesn't matter. Here, this is the circus of like this illusory reality that we think this person has a ton of influence. And just because there's millions of people paying attention to them from our human perspective, from a third dimensional holographic projection, we think that person must be doing so much better than we are and has so much more influence. But what do we even know in terms of who's perceiving what this current conversation even is in the ethers or anywhere else? How many densities are actually being affected by this butterfly effect or, you know, nebula of butterflies that, that is like, you know, affecting and rippling all over. But to come back to that question, so why, why the corruption? To me, it, it comes back to what we were saying earlier about the religion of the inversion as well as that, or even what I was saying in terms of like, you know, becoming sometimes the patriarchal angry stereotype that I'm fighting against. It's simple, like in, in, in order to look at it that way, like if, if you're trying to, you know, like, I, and I think that's what every, every or most of the, conscious prophetic figures that we consider to be ascended masters and to me again like I, I i think we should call them ascending masters not ascended because that implies stagnance it implies you get to a level of perfection you don't need to do anything anymore and it's like no that's a trap it's like thinking you get to nirvana and it's a fucking you know vip club for perfect bliss and, and you're happy and everything is great and you just need to get to there and get out of samsara but many different types of other Buddhism, like Vajrayana, actually express the opposite. And they're like, no, you have to reincarnate here and you have to help every single sentient being achieve enlightenment for enlightenment to actually exist. Otherwise, there's no purpose to it. You're just running away from reality. 
or from illusion to try to reach another illusion, which to you is the cessation of suffering, but only for you and those who deserve it, which is an intrinsically hierarchical principle that's opposite to the fundamental tenets of Buddhism in the first place. So the corruption of that to me is that the beings who were structuring this samsara, these overlords, whatever you want to call them, whether you call them Yahweh or Watigo or, you know, or whatever else, which again, Yahweh to me versus Ja, two different concepts. Mad respect. Like I very much respect and honor Rastafarian doctrines from matriarchal, non-binary, you know, uh, perspective as much as Empress Menon and Ja and like those two complementary opposites and even, you know, queer Rasta is a very important part of the culture. Those are all patriarchal corruptions. But whatever name we give to this, these beings that have coalesced, call it the axis of evil during the, the Second World War, whatever else it is, um, you know, in human form or in higher density form or in lower density form, I believe it's always the same principle as the same as the corruption of Atlantis and Lemuria or the fall of any other previous culture or the corruption of the Illuminati, the infiltration and the infiltration of the Masons and of the presidents and everything else and all these different systems, uh, like this idea of all things falling apart. When somebody comes along with these great ideas and concepts, it implies some kind of hierarchy and frustration and, you know, even for people who don't want a hierarchy and want to break this down, the people that are maintaining the hierarchical structures of oppression, they want to hierarchize the person who is trying to break that oppression and put them above and, and manipulate the masses into believing that that person thinks they're superior to those people and that nobody can reach that level and, and in order for that person to be discredited as a fraud or to be persecuted as a martyr. And then once they're dead, of course, they can restructure and re-manipulate whatever they want to corrupt those teachings and turn it into the opposite so that then people get confused and they're like, well, I practice what they were telling me. But if you, like anybody with you know, um, a critical reflection on any of these scriptures, which ironically, those scriptures in many cases, both say that we should have and shouldn't have. Um, you can see it's full of contradictions. And in Eastern philosophies, contradictions are the basis of existence, whether it's yin and yang or, or cones, like we're talking about, or the idea of the coexistence of God and the goddess of bodhisattvas and kalisattvas of you know, creation and destruction, but in symbiotic sense without the colonial parasitic destructive nature of it, which is, you know, non-recreative. Um, that's not an issue. But when you step into binary uh, heteronormative or oppressive concepts where one has to be above and towering above the other, and you have this lord and slave concept, the head and neck that like, you know, the bondsman and the, the, or the serfdom implied with the, the king or the, 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 the you know, the, the, the aristocrats versus the proletariat, then you fall into this disbalanced structure where there is no choice but to have a misinterpretation and a corruption. And so we're trapped in that. But of course, when anybody tries to explain that, it's been either people have been very loved for it and figures, I, I think like some of the greatest revolutionary figures in that sense had to be more peaceful than violently militant because as much as people love Che and, you know, love uh, militant figures across like, uh, like even, even concepts like uh, other, other great revolutionaries, like whether it's the Zapatistas or like, you know, uh, across the planet, like the, the Zulu warriors or like any of the ancient kingdoms, like, you know, the Dogons or, or even the Queens, like, the ancient, I don't want to start naming specific names because even like in blanks and memories, but then the more names you name, the more people are going to sit there and be like, what about this person? What about this culture? You talked about this one, but you didn't do, or like, you're like, oh, what about, you know, the oppression? Oh, so did you realize what was going on right now? Did you know when it was like the crisis in Darfur, people were like, oh, do you know about, oh, so did you hear what's going on in Darfur? And somebody was like, oh, well, no. Or like, you know, when it was like recently with Aleppo and Syria, you know, being bombed and, and other stuff, people were like, oh, you don't know what's going on in Aleppo. I'm like, do you know what's going on in like 5,000 other cities on the planet right now that aren't being commercially processed on CNN? No, but, but you're acting like it's ignorant not to know the shit that you just read in a mainstream media that distorted the story to make you believe that for you to be an activist, you have to know about this one current issue and then you're good. It's like people being like, shut up about my steak, I recycle. And I'm like, I just found out two days ago that those little signs that say that everybody think means recycle with the numbers on them, 
They were created in the 1970s as a sustainable initiative. They don't even mean that something is recyclable. It's a, it's a common creative common sign that anyone can use even on non-recyclable products. But they, say they put that on there for people to feel comfortable. And I was just reading an article in The Guardian yesterday that my mom shared with me that ironically she didn't even remember sending to me because she's constantly sending me petitions and articles and shit to sign. So she was like, oh, I don't even remember I sent you that. And I was like, what the fuck? So I'm lucky that in Quebec is like one of the most, you know, which is also a native name, you know, even like Niki Totigwak, which is like the, the, the native name of, of uh, the Abenaki name of Sherbrooke, which means where the rivers fork. So these names that we have even in Canada, and I don't even remember now consciously what Canada originally means, but that's also a native name. So, and I don't even remember what, what nation that is ironically, which is, you know, supposedly my own country. Um, so the conscious limitation of us as human beings within a society where even, yeah, let's talk about, you know, I'm a, part of that is the electromagnetic distortions of the, the disruptive frequencies of the screen that I have in front of me, which is liquid crystal depictions, which are specifically made to hypnotize people into addictions, just like drugs, just like anything else, because you're craving the disruptive frequency, which is, you know, uh, this article I was reading about one of the original military developers of that technology said they use that to fry people's brains and eyes like eggs to disrupt and disorient their enemies when they were sending those frequencies, which are the exact same currency levels as the ones being used in all technology. And like I said, in one of the tracks recently that I was, uh, I think it's Imperial March off of um, the latest album with Seku, uh, uh, Mr. Ku and his brethren, uh, LB, I believe, from more like two, two Rasta, like, uh, you know, a really, really deep uh, brethren from Edmonton, but originally from, from many other places. So those were the, those were like the series of albums. Like I did, I did, um, what was the original? Like we started with Mr. Ku. I started like every year we would randomly meet and do like a really quick EP in a night with like four tracks, just sit there, bang it out a couple hours, record it and get out of there. And we'd always run into each other at the weirdest places and be like, yo, want to go do an album? Like, yeah, let's do it. So, we, uh, so that one, the latest one, Imperial March, where I was talking about, it, I was like, um, I talk about a lot of different issues, but essentially I was explaining it. I, I don't even know anyone that's expressed that reality. And again, it's like hiding the truth right in front of our eyes. And it's not like I thought about that. I'm like, everybody, any scientist that you mentioned that and whoever, whatever being inspired me to even ponder that reality, I'm like, how fucking simple is that? We know, or most people that have studied, if you remember, you go back in your textbooks and like, terms of uh, science, you're like, oh, right, there's electrons, protons, neutrons. So electrons are negatively charged, protons are, you know, positively charged, neutrons are neutral. Um, why the fuck don't we have neutronic and protonic energy? Why do we only have negatively charged energy? Why do, furthermore, it's not even about just being negative, but why are we, why do we mostly have acidic foods when we're supposed to have an alkaline diet to have a slightly alkaline but balanced 7.8 pH body, which is mostly made of water, which is meant to be naturally alkaline. Why do we eat nothing but acidic foods and surprise ourselves that we get diseases when the guy who discovered cancer in like whatever, like 1928 or something like that, Otto von Warburg, and won a Nobel Prize for discovering cancer, also discovered the cure for it, which was an alkaline environment. So it can't exist in an acidic environment. So it's as simple as eating alkaline foods, which means no animal agriculture um, and, you know, no processed foods, no deep fried foods, essentially even generally raw foods or slow cooked foods like Atal Rastas, you know, you simmer stuff, which is like that, that like Bob Marley track, like, you know, simmer down. So it's like, it's funny that the truth is so simple. Because you're like, oh, right, we have technology that's not tuned to chakra frequencies, that we know what the, the, the spectrum is, we've measured them. We know that electromagnetically, all this technology is specifically engineered negatively. There's no counterbalance. The frequencies are specifically made at frequencies which are disruptive to the human brain, which is what causes tumors and all kinds of other you know, problems and, and mind manipulation and, and memory blanks. and. And they were developed as military technology to fry your eyes like eggs, literally, and other shit. And we have to operate in a world like this where everything is in a grid, where we have, you know, wires above us radiating large amounts of that energy, which was discovered by a person who ironically wanted it to be free and be in the ethers instead of 
you know, quantify and, and, and impose from unsustainable technology and slave labor mine minerals. And it's like, so the truth is so simple, but it's so complex to even continue functioning in it and know what to do or how to start doing something about it. But again, it starts with really simple steps. It's like, oh, so animal agriculture is the greatest destructor of our health, the environment, the planet, and the greatest genocide in history. And the reason that we're in the greatest mass, ex mass extinction event in the past 65 million years since the dinosaurs disappeared. Okay, let's shut down animal agriculture and go back to sustainable living off the land, wild, like harvesting plants in the wild, living off grid or having a grid of Tesla based energy, having sustainable renewable energies and talking to indigenous peoples and Métis people and Aboriginal people about sustainable hunting and fishing and how to do that mythologically while respecting beings, um, you know, and offering them a higher incarnation, just like if you accidentally step on an insect, if you have the sentient awareness of how precious that life is and how complex of a micro bioorganic technology that is and how unreproducible it is even with our highest standards currently, you would wish for it to have the greatest reincarnation possible. And that's how Buddhist monks and nuns and, and, and whatever, and Rinpoches and, and Bodhisattvas and Kalisattvas had this heightened awareness of the preciousness and the sacredness of life, which even Khalil Gibran talks of in his book, The Prophet, and like, which is the yeah, other album I did about that way back in the days with Prince Armand and Ali Dehesh, which, so all of that is like, it's there, it's there, but there's so much conflicting information, which is exactly what the elites want to do. They want to jumble, they wanted to, and they still in some cases want to jumble the information, make it contradictory, make it seem like people who are trying to simplify it are dumbing it down for people thinking that the masses are too stupid, or making it seem like if they're not acting like that, that they're acting like pompous academics or intellectuals that are, are way too complicated, but they created the very academic systems that, that are structuring that hierarchy for that knowledge to be inaccessible. And they make free education at lower levels, propaganda, and higher education where they finally tell bits and pieces of the truth to be at high rates that most people can't afford or have been too poisoned or occupied with basic living standards to be able to, to take the free time to do. And then even at that level, there's so many other corrupted aspects of advertising and business and petroleum research and pharmacology that's all so that the social sciences, even then in their non-corrupted states or anti-colonial states, are mired with not enough people paying attention to them, underfunding. And even then, when you get to the point of actually doing that, so many people writing papers about what to do, like I said in, in one of the tracks, I'm like, yo, we do not need more concrete solutions. We need more dreamers and seers to complete the blueprint. Because it's like, yo, keep dreaming, keep writing, keep you know, creating art, keep being creative, dance, do, do stuff that people don't usually do. Don't be normal. Don't blend in. Don't, you know, make people uncomfortable if, if the truth is uncomfortable for them. Make people comfortable if they feel oppressed and they feel marginalized. Don't trivialize the most oppressed beings in the world, like thinking that animals that are literally the equivalent of like a three month baby to a maybe six year old girl when they're so-called full grown adults are being pumped full of hormones to look like adults and then slaughtered at a fraction of their lifetime just because some people say they like the taste of it. And I'm like, or the byproducts, I'm like, you're drinking grape juice from a mother that was murdered, whose child was fucking ripped apart to create veal for a fucking person who's like mm, tasty baby flesh and i'm like that's like fucking snuff pedophilia and then people are like how dare you compare that to rape and pedophilia and, and even people that have been like i've been sexually abused my whole family was raped and abused as children like i've been like and people still don't even get it it's like jewish people in the holocaust that i was saying earlier saying like yo they've been through that and they're telling you what they went through is not even comparable. Those animals are going through worse in way larger numbers, in way more systematic structures. And people who don't even have that notion of suffering on a personal or even ancestral basis are still trying to challenge that. 
like they have the right to say that while they perpetuate not only torture and oppression and slavery, but massive environmental destruction of their own health, of their own brain, of everyone else around them, famine, like pollution. So it's like, oh, how simple is it that literally you're like, oh, and people that are religious, that's the biggest part. I'm like, your own religion tells you in the Quran, like in the surahs, Muhammad said, do not make your peace be upon them. Said, do not make your bodies into a graveyard. Like, and, and said that in one of the cases, that, and, and many Muslims I've talked to have been like, oh yeah, I know about that story. I forget the name even of the person, but there was different, like, you know, particular like holy uh, man that was speaking to another one who accidentally stepped on an ant and got stung. And so he stopped the whole ant hill. And so this, this prophet said, what you do, you just stopped an entire colony of worshipers of Allah. And you will be judged for this just as much as you would be for a human life. Because you had no right to take the life of an entire colony because one of those ants stung you. And so, and it also says in another um, surah at one point, or in another, um, actually, a hadith, um, that uh, well, some people like the hadiths, they're not real because it's not part of the Quran. I'm like, that's like people saying the Apocrypha is not a part of the original Bible. Those are sometimes the most relevant parts that the, you know, the, the, the main authorities that are corrupted don't want people to know are leaving out specifically to discredit those, those realizations. But essentially, and, uh, and I, again, forgive me because I'm not, I haven't even read the whole Quran. I didn't grow up Muslim, although I do consider myself, as I said, like a Sufi in, in some senses. So this, this idea of like many different hadiths speak about how you will be um, judged the same, not only for, you know, insects, but also for animals, that every animal that we've killed and eaten will be there on judgment day to pass judgment upon our souls for what we did. And it's not that they say you're absolutely not allowed to do that. Back in those days, living in desert conditions where there was practically, you know, in many cases, you know, very little agriculture, very little other choices, just like Inuits in the Arctic or indigenous people in winter, it said, essentially, one of the hadiths said that, you know, the idea with uh, halal slaughtering is not that we should kill animals, uh, you know, and eat them, or in a halal way. The idea or the thought, supposedly, that Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him, actually came up, uh, up with in, in that concept is that you're supposed to be eye to eye with the animal and stare at them before you put that blade to their throat and cut it. And the thought is that you would connect with that animal deeply enough to realize that if there's any other option for your survival or for theirs, you would not do it. So this was purely out of like, you know, a, a survival basis. Whereas nowadays, it's gotten to the point where a lot of Muslims don't even know that those factories literally have robots saying automatic, like, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, every time a, a throat is slit and the, the blood is slit. There's nothing that is halal about that. And even, you know, the, the shirt that I have, like you know, one of my uh, Muslim uh, friends recently was like, no, it's not like that. When I eat halal chicken, it's halal. I was like, yo, let's go look. And I looked up a halal factory on YouTube. And she was like, yo, that's not halal. I was like, that's what they say it is. It's certified, it's stamped right there. It's the same as people being like free range. And there's a tiny little fucking door, a 20,000 square foot warehouse with 400,000 chickens in it. And like, you know, there's maybe like three chickens that manage to walk outside out of that. All the other ones are cramped together. Some of them do have free range, but how many people visit the farm they go to to go look at that? And how many people would want to be a chicken even in a nice farm where eventually your fucking children get fucking tossed out if you don't? Um, and my apologies for the swears. It's just like, this, this is maddening to me. Um, you know, but I mean, like, for a lot of religious people are like, oh, uh, and I think there's another funny video by Osho about the, the, how magic the word fuck is and how it can be used as, like, a verb, transitive, and intransitive, as a noun, as an adjective, as, like, so it, it's funny to look at and, and even the origins of that, um, which what, uh, oh, you know, my, uh, one of my, um, actually, like, a, ironically, a false ancestor who was in the Navy and was a very oppressive person who was responsible for most of the abuse of my family. I'm not even going to name them. They're dead now. They killed themselves. But um, taught me that in the Navy, fuck actually came from the term found under carnal knowledge. And that this was an acronym for when they found two sailors that were fucking each other.
So, well, that's interesting. I think it probably goes way farther back than that, but I suppose in military sense, that's part of like this idea of the dominance again of like this, the slave, like the master slave the dialectic, you know, which is very much what, what the army indoctrinates people with. But yeah, that, that to me is maddening to think that like the answer is so simple, which think these religious people that are like, don't be a heathen, you know, don't seek material possessions and pleasure. But then at the same time, they don't do any of the basic fundamental tenets that are right in front of them, which they persecute, they judge, they, but they're like, I'm not judging. God's going to judge you though. I'm like, what do you think happens when you let somebody else judge for you and you agree with that judgment? That's judgment by association. That's exactly like saying, I'm not killing any animal, but I'm paying this person to rape and kill them. And then I'm not responsible. That's the same as fucking somebody saying, well, you push that button. That bomb's going to drop there. I didn't do anything. I didn't drop that bomb. I didn't kill those people. I just pressed the button or I did the order. You're still guilty. Of course, the other person who ordered that in the hierarchy and the chain of structure and the command is important to look at. And I think in context, a lot of people think we should assume responsibility for our actions. We should for what we're actually responsible and conscious and aware for. But when you have that awareness and you look away from that to try to avoid it, that is also our responsibility. So you can't say, I don't want to hear this. Like a lot of people are like, I don't want to hear this. It's going to make me sick. I won't be able to eat my pork sandwich. I'm like, that's the whole fucking point. Right. If you feel sick and you want to ignore where it came from and what it's doing, what do you think it's doing to your body when you say you are what you eat? Why would you want to be a domesticated, enslaved, raped, and tortured, overgrown, hormone-laden child? Why do people wonder why they feel enslaved and helpless and tortured? And I've said that. People are like, shut up. You're saying that I caused my own, that's not fair. I didn't get raped. I'm like, I didn't say you got raped because you eat raped animals. I'm just saying if you want that slavery and that unconsciousness to stop perpetuating itself, you can't continue perpetuating slavery and rape and oppression and then complain that it's happening to you. I don't think any of it is justified for any being. I don't think any, I don't even think a rapist should be raped, but I definitely think that they should fucking pay for it. Like, I think they should be beat the fuck up or some other shit, but I don't think that another sexual perversion is going to heal a sexual perversion. So to me, it's like there, there's, yeah, that, that's, that's something that I've had many different people, actually, mostly Judeo-Christian people. And to me, like, I, it took like everything in my mind to not either beat the shit out of those people or literally want to kill them on the spot. But they're like, well, maybe, not even maybe, actually, the two different people that told me that the last time were like, well, you know, God has a plan for everything. So did you ever think that your grandfather raped you and your family for a reason as children and that God had a plan for that and that maybe you were supposed to reach other people through that and to learn and to grow? And I was like, do you even realize what you're saying right now? That's like people saying like, well, you should be grateful for residential schools because look at all this resilience culture that came out of it and the beautiful art and look at all the anti-colonial activism that you've done. Aren't you proud that this happened to you? You wouldn't be the people you are today if it wasn't. And I'm like, that's how a holy war starts. That's how like, you know, I can see now why the crusades or some other shit, I can imagine, you know, a Christian, self-righteous Christian standing there telling a Muslim like, oh, hey, your girl got raped, but don't worry. There's a reason for that. Oh, we bombed your city or something like that, but God has a plan for you. Right. I, like somebody would grab someone like that and slit their throat and say, that was God's plan for you. Don't worry about it. I wouldn't blame them. I wouldn't be like, oh, how dare you do that? It's like Amer Rahman, who's like one of my favorite comedians in uh, Fear of a Brown Planet. In one of the skits, he actually says, or they, they actually say, I don't know what, what gender uh, pronoun they go by, but I, um, from what I remember, I, I believe he, but... So Amer talks about this whole frustration about people saying that, you know, liberals like, you know, being frustrated, some liberals being frustrated about this idea. I forget which what was it. You could probably tell me the name. I forget the name now, but this famous, like kind of right wing, like neo-Nazi personality who got punched in the middle of an interview by a random passerby. Oh, Richard Spencer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. See, I was thinking Jordan Peterson. I'm like, no. So, so when that happened, and he was like, and he's like, and some liberals were like, oh, well, I don't know. I don't know if this is right for, you know, I don't know if we should really punch a Nazi in the face because, you know, where does it start? You punch a Nazi and then the next thing you know, and he was like, what the fuck is wrong? 
Like, what does punching a Nazi lead to? Punching more Nazis? How could that be bad? Like, it's like, seriously, like, why are people so, and that's the problem. People are like pushing Ahimsa to realizations that don't even make sense. It's like, oh, be peaceful. Oh, you're being raped and tortured or your child's being raped and tortured? Be patient. Offer them a vegan meal. Hope that they change their mind. Um, you know, no, nobody would do that with someone if it was happening to your sister or your brother or your, but somehow as soon as we're detached enough from it. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so what about Gandhi? Did oh, no, sorry, my voice is like, Give me a second, I'm, I'm just gonna sip this, uh, this oregano, uh, uh, I, I cold steep some oregano from the garden and, and so <laughs> bring water. So I was like, my voice is fucked I get pissed off of this stuff, but. Right, totally. Well, I mean, you, your vocal cords get quite a workout, I imagine. <laughs> yeah, well, I, ironically, I haven't even been rapping for, like I said, like a month and a half, but I've been, I've been tripping out on, on, on many different people recently uh, about these types of issues who, like, seem to have blockages in terms of, you know, consistent ethics and, and logic, and sometimes even very activist people, which to me is the most frustrating in some ways, because I'm like, if you see this much how hard is it? Like when somebody tells me, that's one of the reasons why they're like, oh, how did you do this and that and that? I'm like, because to me, I stay open. If somebody tells me I'm the king of elves or I have the blueprint to change humanity, I'm like, great, let's see that. Let's work on it. <laughs> I'm not going to be like, shut the fuck up. Who are you? So that, that leads to wonderful, you know, unexpected occurrences, just like children seeing the world of the magical. But to go back to Gandhi, um, that's something I didn't even know. I, conceptual. I used to idealize Gandhi and Mother Teresa too, like even more after, even after what I found out about Gandhi. And not to say that those people weren't instrumental in a great consciousness shift in, in one way or another, but, and, and that even in some other alternate density that wasn't archonically corrupted or patriarchally corrupted, they weren't absolutely amazing activists who lived up to every concept that we believe that they did. Right. I just mean but, the, the I just mean the mechanism of not, the strategy of nonviolence, you know. Right, which is very ironic because Gandhi wasn't nonviolent actually. Right. <laughs> Gandhi was a misogynist. Right. Gandhi beat his first wife for like you know, who like came out and said he was very abusive to women. Gandhi was known historically, first of all, was murdered by uh, a, like a hardcore uh, nationalist Hindu activist was more of an activist than Gandhi was because Gandhi was corrupted and so he murdered him because of that. Because everybody, or at least the story goes, now Now there's many more publications about it, that everybody around him because of his influence and because of what was going on was kind of covering up the stuff that he was doing, which involved in, in some cases um, sleeping naked next to uh, teenage girls, including his niece and other girls in the ashram to see if he could stop himself from temptation, which supposedly he never did anything with them, but then also it was supposed to be a privilege to uh, give him a colon cleansing and stick this um, you know, contraption up his anus and clean him, and that was a privilege that he reserved for certain younger women. So, like, the thing is, at the end of the day, Everybody, like, uh, this is a quote, somebody said at one point, this was a quote from Mother Teresa, I never managed to find that Mother Teresa even said that quote, but to me the quote is interesting regardless, because they say that supposedly at one point Mother Teresa said, every being has a little Hitler within them. Speaking of which, Gandhi was friends with Hitler, and um, actually wrote him several different letters, telling him that, uh, and you can find those letters in the public domain now, in one of which he says, uh, you know, I think you've been a wonderful leader for your people and I don't believe here in India the lies and propaganda that people are spreading about you being uh, an oppressive leader. And I do believe, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but essentially that, that was the gist of it. So that whole nonviolence shit falls out the window when you look at that. And even a lot of other stuff, like a lot of people think that Gandhi was in a certain sense a pawn of the British Empire which was encouraging nonviolent resistance so that they wouldn't have a, a revolutionary upheaval and overtake the, the country's administration, but, you know, was still encouraging people to, to be supposedly sustainable while promoting passively and subversively patriarchal and colonial ideals. So, and, and perverted, you know, like kind of behind the scene perverted, which, which to me, 
I don't even look at like that perversion is far from the worst if you look at, you know, because supposedly most of those women were of age, were like 18 and like they were young. Some of them may have been younger. I don't know. But from what I understand, so Gandhi would have been like a perverted, abstinent peeker on, you know, porn hub that looks at fucking or, you know, that meets, uh, uh, you know, women and then tries not to sleep with them, but has a lot of fantasies. And so there's way worse fucking people in history that, that have done sick fucking shit, like including Catholic priests and all kinds of other beings and, and even rock stars and a bunch of other, you know how many people have like said, you know, rock stars get a pass for sleeping with like Roman Blansky, like raping a 13 year old or like a bunch of other shit that like is like, you know, and people are like, ah, oh, those are like celebrities, you know, and like they're groupies and it's like, it's fucking crazy. So it's not even that that's the worst. It's horrible regardless. But what I'm saying to me, that's a byproduct of this whole idea of like abstinence and celibacy as the doorway to enlightenment when it's like, what the fuck? No. <laughs> like, Tantra is like the union of like the sacred essences of like, to me, celibacy and, and, and abstinence is a, is, it's a patriarchal mind trick. It's a colonial trap which is specifically designed to create perversions. Right. So it was made to enslave people into the construct that they could only be happy when they profoundly were unhappy and denying their own pleasures. Uh. And then instead they seek pleasures in supporting tacit forms of pedophilia and snuff and rape through the food industry and the enslavement industry while they're being pushed with notions of righteousness and, and freedom because they're being good abstinent Christians, but they're eating tortured, raped children. Like, I, I totally get why we're at a point now in like so-called postmodern and, and surreal and, and futuristic and, and you know, so-called post-colonial society, which, which isn't, which is really neo-colonial, where you have shit like Rick and Morty and South Park and, and, and Discordian philosophies and, you know, artists like, uh, authors like Robert Anton Wilson or, or William Reich, even in some ways that were you know, linked in, in ways that were so profoundly sarcastic of the system or even like Aldous Huxley or, or you know, uh, George Orwell, uh, Margaret Atwood, you know, uh, Neil Hopkinson, like a bunch of other sci-fi and, 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 and queer theorists like, like Bell Hooks or other um, that are profoundly, or native authors, like I was saying earlier, that are profoundly sarcastic and kind of, you know, throwing this bleak, surreal collage of all these different grotesque realities like yeah like 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 thompson highway joking about you know perverted rate like he you know uh made a joke i think in one of his uh, uh um it was turned into a book for like one of his lectures but it, it, he was essentially joking about loving to wrap his tongue around some hot latin when he was talking about being forced to learn latin uh in residential school with priests that sexually abused him but you know using that perversion and flipping it around anti-colonially to be like, I'm glad that I know the language of the oppressor now and that I have learned this etymology kind of like, like I was saying earlier is an instrument of resistance in that way, the same way that portraying all of that in a grotesque way and joking about these figures, joking, people making jokes about Jesus, you know, or about a bunch of other shit, not in a way that completely discredits the, the, the activism of the militants, but that reveals this white supremacist corrupted construct where you can rediscover the real revolutionary figure by joking about the corrupted arconic projection of this figure which has been imposed onto people so i think that's why we're at a point now where we can joke about shit like that somebody could say and i've heard people take my verses sometimes like older verses and read that shit in a sarcastic voice in a really pompous voice and i laugh and i'm like Yo, I get it. I see why people gonna hate me now. I see why some people could be like, look at that spiritual fuck boy. I see why somebody would be like, oh, fuck your turban. And I'm like, I'm like, it's not because like this was given to me by like, like a Southeastern like yogi and Reiki master who like actually doesn't even give a fuck about the decorum of all of that and is queer and is like very open about being unapologetic about all this seriousness and like, but it's still all of these principles. Just like to me, you know, someone like Son of Saturn or like, 
uh, which I'm sure he'd be like, shut the fuck up. Don't say that I'm like this or that. And I'm not trying to say that. But I mean, like people like that who are profoundly discordian and bleak and, you know, unapologetic about their sins and their limitations and their drug abuse and, and a bunch of other shit, but are also very much steeped in, in spiritual realizations and the, 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 the profound nature of, of, of the hidden reality that we forget about. To me, that's the essence of life. That's what a lot of great teachers were trying to speak about. And who knows if they did originally, and we don't even have most of those teachings anymore because now we've been told it has to be so serious and so this and disciplined and don't have sex, don't do drugs, don't do this, don't do... And it's like, yeah, because the word sex and the word drugs and these words, they're all colonial concepts. Don't have sex, practice Tantra, you know, practice erotica. Uh, don't do drugs. Use shamanic medicines. Use them responsibly. Don't be religious. Don't even be spiritual in a in a colonial New Age sense. You know, be. Don't even be woke. Be aware. Be lucid. Be. You know, I don't even know. Like even the word conscious. That's the point. I think we re, we need to redevelop these languages, like like the idea of hip hop being a form of slang, being a form of patois or creole. All of these languages that repurpose elements and restructure new forms of languages, poetically, creatively, linguistically, ethnically, socially, that to me is the rebirth of decolonial reality. That to me is what real anti-colonialism is supposed to be. Anyways, I, I think I've rambled long enough for that. I don't even know when my battery is going to die, but yeah, uh, you, whatever. You, I'm sure you've got other questions too. Like anything you want to throw at me. Yeah, free. no. I've yeah, yeah. I was just wondering, like, how much time you got left on that battery, because uh, I, I it hasn't popped up yet. So, all right, cool. Because there is one one question um, that's like the conclusion question that I definitely want to wrap up with at the end. So, so let me know when there, when there's when we got a few minutes. Only yeah, I'll, I'll tell you as soon as it says battery low, then I'll, I'll tell you that for sure. Cool, for sure. So and yeah, again, the funny thing, like I said, I don't even think like I don't. I probably won't be able to use this laptop for like fucking three months after this until I actually find the random charger that, that works with this. But right. like I said, I said like I said exactly thirty three Kuan Yin mantras earlier and didn't even do Reiki on it and right. charged for another four hours. Yeah. And when I stopped after like three or four because I got lazy, I was like, oh, it's working. It stopped charging. So I had to get to 33 to actually let it keep like light. And I didn't touch anything. Like I didn't even touch the charger. I didn't even move in my chair. But And, and I'm like, it's not, I'm not a, you ask anyone, I can't even heal someone. But somehow with technology, I've managed to randomly be able to do that just through the pure power of thoughts, which to me is like the Shinto concept of like, everything is sentient. There is no thing. Right. Yeah, exa sorry, exactly. Sorry, but I, I wanted yeah. to express that because I think it's important for people to realize objects are not objects. Everything around you, if you treat it in a way which is respect, which a lot of people do that with their cars, they're like, oh, this, this microphone's my baby. Right. This is like, I really take care of my headphones. If you don't go like stupid fucking phone or like you smash some shit when you're angry, if you don't objectify or possess right. um, items and you realize it's all flows of energy and we're all interconnected, then you right. don't get possessions. You don't get possessed and you exercise yourself, which is also like exercise, literally like doing exercise. But yeah, right. yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, like on, on just on that note, real quick, I one thing that I've tried to shift in my own language around my life is I try to use possessive ab adjectives as little as possible. So I, I say the to yeah. describe a thing rather than my such and such yeah yeah <laughs> because i you know i acknowledge that that ownership is illusory and there's no such that i can't possess anything so yeah and so uh the other question that i wanted to get into was about science about science fiction and because i'm really fascinated by this um concept you know, I was reading your paper uh, from Sumerians to superheroes, and it, it was really like putting a lot of pieces together of that 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 this that this is the new mythos. You know, that everything that's going on in science fiction seems like it's revealing a lot of the future of what we can do, and you know, our capacities and possibilities. And so, I was wondering, like, about your thoughts on like science fiction as a you know continuation of uh, or a the next phase in mythology of, you know, uh, that's kind of continuing on the tradition of spiritual mythology and uh, contextualizing 
massive change. Definitely. I, I, I entirely agree with that. And, and even more so, that's, that's part of like the idea with Mutant Academy and even with the Invisibles I was talking about earlier to me. And I think now, now if I could retitle that, like I said, I originally wrote that as called The Second Coming in Hip Hop, I think in like 2000, whatever, 2001, 2002 or something. It's a really old paper that I rewrote later because I wanted to represent that with more information. Um, but even now, I don't think I would call it From Sumerian to Superheroes now. Maybe I'd call it, it, it sounds catchy in a sense, but it, it kind of, again, it's kind of a binary concept that trivializes all the other aspects of like the supervillains being demonized, the, super, the anti-heroes, uh, the mutants. So maybe I'd say From Sumerians to, uh, I don't know, like, who, who knows, from, from Homo sapiens to like Homo noeticus or whatever. But um, I think the concept of a hero is problematic. It, it can be. Um, I, I think it is when it's projected without the opposite of that being included within like if you assume that a person is always heroic no matter what happens or even if somebody is striving to always be heroic but the, the problem is also it's problematic to assume that someone shouldn't always be heroic in a world which is so profoundly evil that we would need beings because there are beings many beings in this realm or in other realms that are controlling beings in this realm that are purely evil in many different senses and even the concept of our very existence of daily reality involves a lot of, of unfathomable evils that most people would crumble to dust in horror thinking about that you know you again like the cycle of some sort of religion and, and, and punishment and sin and hell is very easy to grasp in in context looking at that but so that's the conundrum. It's the catch twenty two of this of this reality, in a sense, in that in that colonially binary structure is that if you only want to be a hero, you're negating these aspects of yourself, which are you know like this this quote supposedly from Mother Teresa of the little Hitler within you. But then, if you embrace the little Hitler within you, there's that even greater danger of actually becoming that little Hitler and becoming the monster that you're trying to fight. So then finding the balance between the two, that's the reason why a lot of Eastern philosophies have expressed. And like I mentioned in that, in that book, The Anarchist Primer, where I kind of explained in the beginning about the concept of the middle path and, and how Eastern philosophies have been, you know, the ideal is so unattainable to so many people that then the middle between the two, where you're neither hero nor uh, villain or nor superhero nor supervillain that you're not an anti-hero either you're not a public figure that you're not maximizing suffering you're you're minimizing it but as much as possible but it's impossible to do that and you're also teaching people but not teaching people and you're so th there's a reason why they believe that buddhas and bodhisattvas are Literally, many different scriptures say it's impossible. Like in Jainism, it says it's impossible for Jirthankaras to incarnate in this age. But then the point is, how does this age end then? If it's impossible for those beings to incarnate and for that to happen, that's another nonsense. So then it's a trap because even the so-called philosophies where they're supposed to be teaching you liberation of the soul and the mind and, and how to be heartful and, and compassionate, are unattainable. So imagine going to uh, an alternate school. Imagine being in an oppressive reality where we are right now and having this current educational system. And then let's say something like Mutant Academy, but you know, way better exists in an ideal form, uh, the way that it should be in every way, shape, and form. But then, you know, whoever's in charge of that, you know, not you know, any one person in particular, but whoever is there teaching and everything else is like, okay. So probably one out of one billion of you will graduate from here. And likely you might still be delusional if you think that you did. And people might misinterpret that anyways, and you might not be able to teach it to them properly, but you need to keep going no matter what and hope that one day we can all pull ourselves out of that. I mean, if that was a graduation rate and we were looking at that statistically in terms of improvement for society, we'd all be fucked. So, You've either got the, you know, that's the religious scale you've got is like, you can either be a Christian and all your sins are forgiven if you believe that this person was, you know, pointlessly tortured and slaughtered for you to keep sinning and persecuting and, and perpetuating genocide because you're an ignorant sinner. And the only way you can do that is bow down and realize you could never be anything else than an ignorant sinner unless you recognize that you're absolutely worthless in comparison to that being you could never be like. 
So that's the easiest religious step to do. Because, you know, like they say, it's like, well, you could be a rapist or this and that. You could keep raping as long as you're just like, well, you know. But then there's also the trick that, like, if you're doing that hypocritically, then you're going to burn in hell forever. But also, if you have a realization that you were a hypocrite, even if you've raped 300 people, it's okay. You'll be forgiven. Because, you know, just give yourself to Jesus and realize you're a sinner. And then... So, and then you've got, you know, the other steps, which is like, then you've got Judaism that's a little bit tougher because they don't really believe in this idea of like redemption from one person, which, which a scapegoat that somehow excuses you from constantly sinning, which makes no sense. But then they also have all this misogyny and, and, and aspects that are kind of materialistic. And then you've got the mystical opposite with Kabbalistic and Sephirothic studies. But then that also has been trivialized and the goddess has been kind of hidden you know, the tree of life, that the, the, the 10 points of that used to be 12 points. And even in, like I, I mentioned, like, so, so that was something that in, in Atlantis, there used to be supposedly 12 major temples and points on the island, two of which were offshore, which eventually sunk and became the 12 to 10 points that were corrupted in, in those Sephirothic teachings. But then, and you can even see that it's not symmetrical the way that it should be. Everything else, like the Star of David and the other stuff, has this perfect symmetry in it. That one is asymmetrical, but it seems like it's missing points. And it is. But of course, nobody is teaching that anymore. So then, you know, it's like, or so few people that whoever comes up with that get discredited. And they're like, who are you? You're not an authority to say this. And yet the very people that are being revered as authorities were telling people, don't trust authority. And don't believe what like like Buddha was saying, question everything, including what I said. But then you come along and question what Buddha said, and people are like, "Who are you to question Buddha?" I was like, I, "I don't know." Like, isn't that what he said? Yeah, but you're not intelligent enough to do that. You don't have the proper knowledge enough to do that. And it was like, didn't he say not to study scriptures and to like think for yourself? Yeah, but the scriptures, though, if you don't know them, you can't know that he said not. You do know that, but you have to study everything else and follow everything else. But and it's like, like people don't even realize the nonsense in not having critical thought anymore. So it's weird because it's like no matter what you do, so then you've got all these other steps up, like Islam that's like has more, especially in Sufism or in Sikhism, there's even more and more steps towards, you know, Sikhism, which is kind of like in many different ways an amalgamation of, of Sufi and Islamic thought and, and, and matriarchy and Eastern philosophies like Buddhism and also Hinduism. But then also has patriarchal corruption issues in terms of like, you know, many different um, Sikh temples I've been to only have paintings of Guru Nanak everywhere. And it's like, you walk into it and they're like, okay, well, we respect everyone. And I know they do. And like most uh, Sikhs should be like, logically, most Sikh temples only serve vegan food. And it's like Prasadam, it's like Hindu temples. So that's what it should be. But, you know, some of them don't really ascribe to that. And then those temples say, yeah, we respect everyone, we respect women and men equally, and like all beings and all genders are welcome, all faiths and philosophies, which is very similar to Baha'i uh, temples. But then at the end of the day, they only pray to Allah. And so in Sikhism, it's like you respect all, so I'm like, if you respect all those divinities and you come from Buddhism and Hinduism, why isn't there statues and, and, and depictions of, 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 of Ganesha? And the same in a, in a you know, in a Baha'i temple, I'm like, it'd be really easy. Because those are, it's, 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 it's fundamentally synchronistic with what you're saying. But then there's like 20 paintings of Guru Nanak everywhere. And then there's a statue of Guru Nanak. And I'm like, where's the goddess? Where are the other divinities? Where are the, the watchers? Where are the Nateru? Where are like, like, it's not that complicated to do that. You can just get an Egyptian painting from this thrift store. You can get another one from that one and just put them all up in the temple. It's going to be great. It'd be awesome. Literally, all you need is one person with the authority to be like, hey, that's a good idea. There's nothing fundamentally wrong with that philosophy. And I'm sure there's other temples that would probably want a painting of Guru Nanak. Let's take those 20 other paintings, spread them around to other places that want to do the same thing, and let's trade. And it's as simple as that. But people are like, well, who are you to say that? Well, no, because Guru Nanak said, and I'm like, but Guru Nanak would be like, don't fucking put a single painting up of me right now. I don't want any of those paintings. Why are you worshiping me? And then they'd be like, but, 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 
Jesus would say the same fucking thing. He'd be like, I didn't even want to, I didn't create Christianity. Like, Thomas King has this, like, funny-ass story in um, one good story, that one, that I translated that for my master's thesis. And he has a story in there. Actually, is it in that? It's either, so he's got two different short story collections. It might be in a short history of Indians in Canada. I think it might be in that one, actually. So in one of the stories, he tells a story of Jesus running away from Christians that are chasing him like, like some kind of like, like groupies with an idol or something. And they're like, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Like, and so Jesus hides on this native reserve. And um, the native people there are like, yo, who are you? And he's like, I, I, I'm Jesus, man. I'm like, yo, these, these Christians are fucking crazy. They're like chasing after me. They're like worshiping me. I don't know what's going on, but like, I need a place. Like, I need a safe place. Like, please help me out. And, you know, I, again, I'm paraphrasing because it's been like over a decade since I've read that. But, um, you know, essentially like the one native person is like, yo, I don't know, man. Like, you, you fucked us up pretty bad. And he's like, no, I swear it wasn't me, man. It really wasn't. And they're like, yo, but look at, look at all the shit they did in your name. And he's like, I didn't tell him to do any of that shit. Like, it, I, I was saying the exact opposite. And so eventually they just kind of like laugh about it and they hide him. And, and, you know, I can't even remember what the end of the story is, but it's like, right. I think it's a super good, valid, literal metaphor for what the real Jesus would do. The real Rasta, Ital, Middle Eastern Jesus would do. Like the anarchist revolutionary would be like, yo, I don't want anything to do with these people. Don't even call yourself Christians unless you're going to follow the principles that I talked about. Give up your possessions. Donate to the poor. Don't torture and rape animals. Don't support colonialism. Don't destroy the planet. Live in harmony with people. Respect women and queer people. But, you know, that's why they had to create a fake white supremacist Jesus. That's why they had to create fake apostles. That's why they had to create a fake colonial god. Right. Because, so that's why you know, they the real... Fake, fake hip-hop. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just, and, then, and then use political correctness and authority to be like, how dare you judge us? You're saying we're racist? That's reverse racism. I'm like, that's another one. Amir Rahman has like the dopest two-minute skit on reverse racism on Fear of a Brown Planet. And it's like the funniest shit. I'm not even going to say it. I'll just tell people, go look at just Google Fear of a Brown Planet or just Google reverse racism. Amir Rahman is like, it's, I think it's like AA. H N E R uh, R A H M A N. My apologies, but anyways, if you just Google "fear of a brown planet," um, and, and my apologies to Amir, I, I know how to spell your name. I just like I'm, I'm caught up in some, some stuff right now. Um, but um, but yeah, look up "fear of a brown planet" reverse racism, or just look up "fear of a brown planet" any of the skits, and um, it's hilarious because he breaks it down in a history lesson, which is speculative fiction, where he basically inverts the colonial principle and says. You know, uh, I'm not, I don't even want to the, the ruin the punch of the joke, but essentially he explains reverse racism and he says, I don't believe it doesn't exist. I could be a reverse racist. All I would need is, and then I'll let people go look it up. And so then he explains that principle and what would be needed in order for reverse racism to be practiced. And it's amazing because it's all entirely factual and yet none of it actually happened. So it's, yeah, it's brilliant. So that's my easiest way to avoid like five hour, um, you know, white privilege denial arguments on Facebook or anywhere else. I just post a two minute fucking comedy skit and I'm like, I'm just going to leave this here. You can watch this. And people get mad because they can't say shit after that. They have nothing to argue about anymore. And they're just like, well, what? well, fuck you. It's not the same thing. Or like, it's like, oh, and I'm like, okay. Or they just don't answer or they block me or whatever. And I'm like, cool. Thank you, Amir. Like, you just simplified my life right. a lot. You saved me a lot of time. Now I can go be productive on some other shit. So yeah, comedy. That's another huge, uh, I respect comedians, I think a lot more than, ironically, than people like me. Eh, I seem like I'm a really serious person. I try to joke. I just have a really bad sense of humor. I think when I even try to make a joke and I try to be sarcastic, people think I'm being really serious. Mm -hmm because the joke is too close to home like i mean i'd love to joke about fucking massive genocide and all this shit i just i don't have the fucking i don't have the the, the, the guts to do that i don't have the the i can't i can't do this i can't trivialize something which i'm not even intrinsically living on a level even remotely close to the people that are affected most by that let alone the beings and other levels and densities so 
I have no right with the amount of privilege I have, even with the limitations that I'm currently living with and, you know, being living under poverty level yet with so many resources and, and having access to these different uh, academies and, and centers and having all of these different people helping me and people listening to me and, and, and a voice and, you know, uh, but contrary to what people think, uh, I don't make a hundred grand a year teaching at university. I'm a graduate student still, even though I'm a PhD candidate and a postdoctoral scholar, um, I don't have my postdoctorate yet. I don't officially have my PhD, even though I've defended my candidacy oral and written. So I get paid less than half what somebody working at McDonald's would. Uh, but I don't give a fuck personally in terms of money because I do what I love. As long as I have resources and other people don't mind sharing those resources, like you said, none of that is mine. Those academies, none of them are mine. I don't even manage them. I'm there in some places sometimes to actually spend time, like the one in, in um, Matapedia, um, you know, near Amqui. Um, I'll be there for a while, but I am there as a guest and as a partial, you know, totemic keeper in the sense of part of my traditions as a non-status Métis, um, you know, on Micmac and Métis land, uh, and Beothuk and, and, you know, uh, I don't even know how to translate that in, 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 in Indigenous or in English, but um, there are many different, even extinct peoples who lived on those lands um, who aren't even spoken of anymore, who, whose spirits still roam, who are still part of the fauna and the flora. So those aren't, that's not my land. It's not even under my name. It's not even under my mother's name. It's not, and, and many of them are not even under native names, but some of it has to be reclaimed through colonial um, contracts sometimes, like through banking or through other stuff to actually be decolonized. And so I encourage everyone with that kind of consciousness to purchase land to actually give it back to indigenous communities, to tend to it for indigenous communities, to turn it into rainbow centers, into community centers where you're not the person with the authority, where if any, you know, uh, indigenous council or, or community was like, hey, we want to take it over from now and work on this for a while and help you with this, you're welcome here, but we don't want you managing or having authority over this where you wouldn't say, hey, I have a colonial piece of paper that states this is my property. As soon as you say, this is my land, this is my property, and you know you're standing on unceded native land that's been colonially appropriated through contracts that shouldn't even be valid anymore since the Truth and Reconciliation Commission or the advent of post-colonialism, I think that's the biggest fuck-up of colonial society, which I think is a conscious one for people who infiltrated that and tried to, uh, you know, or were successful in manifesting that shift, is using this language of illusory democracy and freedom and post-colonialism or decolonialism to say, oh, we are decolonial, we are post-colonial, okay. That means all of your treaties are null and void. All of your colonial practices in a time where you now acknowledge was colonial, that you now acknowledge was genocide, none of that is legal. Therefore, the country is not legally yours, your legal system is not a legal one, None of the charges you have against any of those peoples, none of the properties you so-called own, none of the products you exploit or nature that you commodify, none of that is yours. And all of it is indictable for war crimes and for the same, not only just in indigenous, you know, le legislative, which, which doesn't even exist in terms of legislative principles or written, but in indigenous karma, if you want to put it that way, like, like that art, the, the album I worked on recently was inspired by, by Métis, a uh, uh, sister in called Karma, uh, who was called Matai, actually, as a birth name, um, you know, in honor of the, the, the Egyptian goddess Mat, who actually did the, the, the um, Underground Legends documentary that we never ended up publishing with iHuman and, like, other stuff because lack of funds and, like, editing and a bunch of stuff and many other projects. But there's still bits and pieces of that throughout certain videos on, on Facebook. And, but essentially, that, that concept, that indigenous karma coming back, it's not even only according to indigenous principles that those beings are guilty. According to their own colonial legislative systems, they now have admitted to that guilt, just like the banks have admitted that they print money out of thin air based on supply and demand that has no real backing for it. So once that admittance is there, the collapse is inevitable. It's just a matter of the realization of the people on a massive scale, which again is accelerated through art, through activism, 
through education in a decolonial sense, through awareness, through, you know, dancing, through creativity, through podcasts, through writing, you know, literature, oraliture, storytelling, all of it, really, all of these different intersectional avenues through nutrition, through reconnection with nature, um, traveling, like, like Karis one often said, traveling is the best form of education. And I, I believe in that as long as you're doing it sustainably, as long as you're doing it anti-colonially, um, you know, to, to, the, the, to the extent of our limitations. And so that to me is the real apocalypse. It's there. The apocalypse is there, like, like I said, every day. But the more veils are lifted with every person who comes to those realizations on a permanent and consistent basis where they're coming to more and more realizations every day, the more all those people pull their money out of the bank, invest in sustainable agriculture, create communities of exchange, like strive away from, you know, go away from fiat currency systems of illusory manipulation state. Don't trust politicians any, anymore. Trust their intuition, their prescience, question the sponsored corporate uh, lies of propaganda and scientific knowledge in a Western Eurocentric colonial sense. And, and then everything just falls apart, like that song from Edon. It's like, I've had way more experiences than I can even care to share in terms of supernatural phenomena or like Mandela effects, where I'm like, I can sit here all day and talk about that. And people will be like, where's the proof? Where's the proof? I'm like, by quantum scientific reasoning, within the very structures that these people are claiming don't exist, you cannot perceive what you do not believe in. Like most of the, t there are exceptional situations where that may rarely occur. Like somebody who really doesn't believe in some shit and still sees ghosts. But most of the time, people who manifest what they believe is impossible is because they believe in it. If you constantly don't believe in something, if you think you're gonna fail your whole life, it's way more difficult to succeed. If you constantly believe that ghosts are all around us and, and supernatural phenomena are happening on a daily basis and you have magical powers and, and technology is sentient and all you need to do is raise your hand to like, you know, fix a problem. It doesn't just happen automatically because you need consistently, uh, you need consistency and interconnectedness on a level of awareness that, you know, is, is yeah, just like training with martial arts or, you know, sustainability or friendship or anything. You have to cultivate that just like a garden, you know, but it, it is real. And the more you believe in it and work and apply towards that, the more it manifests. So that's why when people are like, yo, how do you stay so optimistic? I'm like, I get really fucking depressed and bleak and sarcastic. And that's why I have that track with Unsay on our latest album, End of Days, called Bitter Victory. Because it is a bitter victory regardless. But the point is, it's inevitable. Empires crumble. Colonialism falls. Right. And the point is, it doesn't ever need to come back if we look at what the cycles were and see why we've been in this cycle and what the word revolution even means, which is, you know, it's, it's a, a revolution could be coming out of a loop and going into a spiral galaxy, which expands and expands into the same concept as that spinning cipher of like poetry or, you know, the whirling dervishes. It can expand into a quantum quasar. But if you're trapped in a closed binary loop, even the symbol of infinity being closed and not expanding into this fractal flower of life, which is opening petals and blossoming, uh, or calculating it numerologically, like there's some kind of an end to, um, you know, uh, ascension, like ascended masters. It's like, oh, you get to nine, or like you get to the seventh heaven, that's the ultimate heaven. Why did they pick seven? Because symbolically it's right before eight. And eight is infinity. So of course they don't want you to go past seven because it's like, don't you dare look at what's after seven. Don't you dare learn more than seven numbers because eight is forbidden. Because eight is indigenous traditions and shamanism and animism and paganism and the goddess. And that's evil. That's the root of all evil. Women are the sinners. Kali is the one who destroys the world. And it's like, nah. Nah. <laughs> the evil motherfucking merchants are at this particular moment right. or anybody who's trying to restrict that knowledge or divide it or calculate or have like a monopoly over what truth or and then people sit and they're like well shut the fuck up you you have a monopoly over like people have said that like a lot to me in terms of like critical they're like well you 
You don't even let people have freedom of difference of opinion. Let me be free to make my own choices. I'm like, freedom of expression is not freedom of oppression. You're not free to like torture and rape and enslave billions of beings any more than you're free to fucking burn a black person on a cross and say, or, or call them a, the N word or, or, that's not freedom. That's not expression. That to me, that's the difference between indigenous principles like say that are applied more in Métis and decolonial aspects of Canada than in some forms of American government, even though, you know, obviously Canada is very colonial in many ways, but uh, one, one uh, Latino um, uh, immigrant in one of the classes I was in actually mentioned to me, and, and I thought it was an interesting point that I never thought about as a Canadian, because I'm very critical of this system and of this reality, especially as a Métis person, as a decolonial activist, I'm like, fuck people being like, Canada's the land of the free and Canada's so much better than the U.S. I'm like, it is, but that's like comparing a fucking date rapist that, you know, is really polite with their victims and wait until they pass out to actually rape them and they wake up with a memory blank versus the fucking genocidal tyrant that's like doing it while they're fully aware. Um, you can't be like, oh, this is so much better. We shouldn't complain. But still, like what he was saying from, from the perspective of a person who was like newly arrived in Canada was like the difference that he said that, that I've seen or that they said that they've seen with the United States versus Canada is that the, the Canada somehow is still somewhat steeped in some socialist and indigenous principles, which mitigate the colonial aspects of the intensity which the U.S. carceral system and police system, you know, and, and, and gun system and, and all of that, it, it makes it so much more intense because of the privatization of the medical system of the, so this idea of universal health care, even if it's toxic medical substances or um, other aspects are slightly more socialist in some ways and, and much more in others than a lot of United States. But then now when you look at, you know, where, where you're at, you look at California, Oregon, uh, many other progressive states, a lot of that actually is more progressive than most of Canada. So in Quebec, we have a lot of socialist aspects, which are very intense on recycling and green, um, you know, most of pretty much all, this is like a hundred, like I said, the, the whole community, the, the wider community here, the whole region, the greater uh, area is about 170, almost 200,000 people. Uh, that's probably like, I don't know how many hundreds of kilometers of radius, but within even just the urban center, within 10 or 15 kilometers, there's like eight different organic co-ops that are all cooperative run. So non-chain stores, nobody owns the store. It's all managed by different people who work there. And whatever leftover food they have that's about to go bad, they either donate to charity or whatever is left that they can't donate to charity, the employees can take home if they want. Or they can give it to somebody else if there, there's regulations that stop them from donating it. So to me, I'm like, I try to be conscious of that even when I purchase discounted products with my mom because I'm like, I know my mom doesn't mind me dumpster diving stuff for myself, but also because she's in a different tax bracket than I am as a university professor, you know, she doesn't want to be diving in the back, especially in a city where there's other people that need that food that are diving for that. She doesn't want to go there with a person making six digit figure a year as a, you know, 63 year old decolonial professor, even then teaching you know, activism and sustainability, it's not fair for someone like that to go there and be like, oh, I'm going to grab this food for free. And a lot of people would look at it very weirdly. Not fuck the weirdness, who cares? But the point is, if you're making over 100 grand a year and you're taking food away from somebody else that needs it way more than you do, buy some discounted stuff, support your local co-op, invest wisely and sustainably, but, you know, don't go steal resources away from somebody else. So when I'm broke as fuck, I dumpster dive, but even when I do, and I'm there and other people come along, whether they're homeless or even they're people that are in a way higher tax bracket than me, you know, older, you know, like hippie people or like, you know, even cool, like eco-environmentalists that are driving up in their nice little hybrid or something. And they're like, I'm like, yo, here, I got this whole box full of stuff. Anything you want in there, feel free to grab it. I don't care. Even if I walk home with like three salads and two zucchinis and a couple you know, potatoes. I'm good for the night. I'm happy. But when I'm here with my mom and I'm not, you know, I have different means. I'm helping her. 
I'm working, you know, for free here, renovating this house we originally purchased together. Um, and she really doesn't have, you know, it sounds like that, but you look at the tax bracket, you look at the amount of tax as a socialist um, province that Quebec makes, she gets taxed 55%. So if she makes a hundred and, 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 you know, 10 grand a year now as a tenured professor, 55% tax off that plus mortgage, plus like all the other stuff that's on this, on a house like this, because the banks are fucking scammers and, you know, plus travel expenses and everything else for the conferences she's given in terms of like, you know, and then you would love to have, my, my mom would love to have conversations with you on science fictional stuff. And she's been talking, like I said yesterday, about, you know, uh, apocalyptic scenarios and all that. She could have answered a lot of these questions probably in, in more depth in terms of uh, different authors and scenarios in terms of the apocalypse and the literature that she studied in terms of queer theory, feminist theory. She has a lot more academic knowledge in terms of those activist scholars than I do. And that's where I learned a lot of it from. But nowadays, in terms of sustainability, I'm back here to remind her how to actually step that up. How to like, you know, I'm like, oh, here, let me get you some used solar panels for the roof. Let's get that because you don't want to buy new ones because that's slave labor technology from China or like from other places that are mined in Africa or like, so she's like, oh, well, I didn't even think about that because in my generation, we didn't even have to think about GMO or organic or is this imported? Is this vegan? But is it sustainable? Or so that's cool. Cause like, if we look at elders like that, like they can teach us a lot, but if the elders look at us, like we can teach them stuff as well. The same way that I was talking about activists and pacifists and my mom is, you know, an activist, but a pacifist activist in many different ways where she doesn't want to be violent with people. She doesn't, she's at an age where she does a ton of yoga and she's very healthy. She looks like she's probably 20 years younger than she actually is. But, and people are like, yo, she's very strong and she's constantly gardening and planting trees and, you know, running and doing a bunch of stuff. But also she doesn't want to be going in and running and throwing Molotov cocktails of cops that are corrupted or, or, or beating up protesters or, you know, because she's like, Hey, I'm, I'm past that age. Some people aren't, which is great. And I'm trying to make my mom be more on the front lines, but even in the city, you know, it's, it's very much, it's in transition in terms of fair trade and sustainability. Like I was saying about equitability um, uh, or equity. So there's not a lot of hardcore activist action happening. There's a lot of grassroots activism, but not, you know, there's, there's not a lot of hardcore oppressive shit going on. Like you would have in Sacramento or in other places you know, in Los Angeles or in New York or, you know, we, I don't even know if there's a single cop that's murdered anyone in this precinct here in Montreal, definitely. Here, maybe there would have been, you know, in the past five years, I'm sure there's been uh, some kind of death that's happened. But in the case, in Canada, in some cases, um, it's much more common for cops to get either suspended or fired for shit like that. And if they shot someone 20 times in Canada, there'd be a major inquiry into that shit. They would likely get charged for murder, but there's a lot of fucked up shit. There's a lot of cops still shooting that, but in terms of proportion, it's still nowhere near compared. I think me and Ali compared, it was like a hundred times worse in a city like Sacramento versus the worst city in Canada. So my battery just turned on the low level. Uh, you were saying you had like a conclusion question you wanted to yeah, yeah, definitely. So yeah, to conclude, I've kind of been asking people like to try to try to give a one paragraph synopsis of what utopia looks like. What what's your vision of like a society that's worth working towards? Like, what are the some like main points? You know, like what would a society, what would a world without patriarchy and racism and homophobia and transphobia, ableism, all that? Like, what would a world without that look like? You know, like Yo, to me, honestly like anything anyone could paint it like and anybody with enough creativity that's why it's wonderful to think that we shouldn't nobody should take my word for it but the way if anything what i like to think of and and that's uh, an album i wrote recently which to me is is that that blueprint for the inspiration you spoke of is the island of immortals which is you know asian mythology that a lot of people don't really refer to much anymore but it's this idea of this place which is actually so far beyond even a buddhist paradise or something like that that Everybody there is even beyond like a concept of like a superhero status or anything like that. It's like people are like telepathic, telekin telekinetic, have like all kinds of different abilities are like, if you can 
Imagine the unimaginable. If you can paint a picture in a multidimensional fractal density that no, none of the greatest painters could ever do. If you could imagine the, an amalgamation of all of your favorite poetry and literature and, and art and paintings and movies and experiences and, and transcendental realizations and piece that all together in some kind of anarchic, like multidimensional intersectional collage and then dream about evolving that into infinity and dream about your wildest dreams and then think that that's just the stepping stone towards the next step after that. I look at that as like taking Edan's deconstruction as the blueprint for the beginning. And, and like one of the last things that my father left before he disappeared, where I believe now he's in his community in the Arctic, uh, again, somewhere around Inuvik, like, like, or even past the, the polar circle, where he did in cold training. That's the last thing I wanted to say, cold training. For us with paler skin tones, and I have a mix and match of both, I can tan a lot, but yeah, in the cold, like I was saying last time, that's like primordial. For people, if you have that ability, please train in the cold, train in the heat, train in the elements, and be at one with nature and with those aspects as much as possible. Um, but yeah, that, that utopia or that ideal expression of reality, I don't want to define it for anyone, but I want to say even our wildest imagination in these current restricted concepts and boundaries, we can think infinitely beyond it. That's just the first step. Deconstruction, decolonialism is the first step. Those, those science fictional scenarios of utopia and of dystopia, just remember the dystopias are a warning. They're not a manifestation. We are living those dystopian scenarios, so we don't need to worry about them happening because they already have. And in quantum reality, that realization is coexisting right now. So what we have to worry about is deconstructing our current dystopia so that those utopias can finally flourish. And what I would say at the end of the day, if people want to have more of a constructive idea is go check out the website. I'll keep updating it. There's tons of artists on there, tons of poetry, tons of links and portals to other portals, to other portals, to other portals. So fractals to other fractals. And even if it's in within this archonic technology, don't spend too much time on your computer, but look at that, look at those authors you know, read up on those authors, find hard copies of books, go to secondhand bookstores, support local, support sustainable, support co-op, don't support property, decolonize, um, you know, support creativity and art and artists and, and don't purchase anything without actually researching. Look at the ingredients, you know, don't buy corporate shit. Don't use corporate substances. Like there's so many thrift stores. There's so many ways to repurpose and reuse, get creative with everything. If you break something, fix it, glue it, rebuild it into something else, make a piece of art with it. Take an empty bottle and can, repurpose it, make some earth ships, build some yurts and, and you know, like imagination and, and the sky isn't even the limit. It's like, it's, it's infinity blossoms into concepts beyond that. So, so all I would say is look, and I'm not trying to plug anything about the website or anything. We don't sell anything. Even the stuff that says that there's a price for it, it's just a suggested donation. You can click on each of those albums and download them all for free. If any artist has stuff, and some of them have a few albums for sale, you can purchase those ones. Many others are for sale. Um, I can speak for myself personally. All I would say is everything is free on there. Everything we encourage people to do is give back to whatever you want, as long as it's sustainable, as long as you're trying to keep in mind what priorities should be, who needs it the most, what we really should be considering in terms of the most oppressed beings. Keep the insects, keep the plants, keep the indigenous peoples, keep animals in mind. We're all sentient beings. Don't practice speciesism. Um, don't be a hypocrite vegan. Don't be a hypocrite meat eater if you're going to eat meat. Talk to indigenous people. And if you don't have their permission to hunt on the land, you don't even know the land that you're on and you're hunting, you're not doing it sustainably. If you can't think of an animal as having a superior reincarnation as you and going far beyond these mythological realities, and you can't be at one with the beings who honored them, you're a hypocrite. And we're all hypocrites to a certain extent. Anyways, I'm gonna stop that shit there. But like, what I mean is like, be creative, be imaginative, and don't just listen to what I say. Question everything like like we were saying earlier and realize that there is no thing. Nothing is a thing, it's all energy and consciousness. So, and, and laugh at me and, and call me whatever the fuck you want, make jokes about it if you want. Uh, you know, make a joke like uh, South Park with Kanye West and the gay fish. I don't care, 
Um, you know, do whatever you say. Say Anton's a fucking fake wannabe, fucking ultra spiritual JP Sears guru. I don't give a fuck. That's fine. Um, you know, joke about whatever you want, and I don't mean you, anybody else. That's cool. We need every perspective to piece together. Just know that that's one of the reasons why I'm going off grid right now, and people won't see me for a while. This is my kind of farewell to a lot of people. That's why I talked a lot. I blabbered a lot. Uh, some people will know how to reach me. I'll still check the email once in a blue moon when I hit up a village or like a reserve nearby and go check that on this laptop if I can actually find a proper charger. If not, you probably won't hear about me for a while, but I'll still be publishing random albums here and there when they do come out with other people. And that's about it. Thank you infinitely for this. Thank you for everything you've done. Thank you for introducing me to the love of my life and for all that's been done and my apologies if they ever hear this for everything that i've put them through and every other soulmate uh, you know past present and future for all of the limitations all right thank you <laughs> oh. oh i guess the computer died and i didn't quite get a chance to tell him thank you but i mean i'll text him it but wow um so yeah i i don't even want to add much to the end of that so uh thanks for listening everybody love y'all you could spark a revolution with your thoughts whatever you choose is your artist so choose wisely of symbiotic existence.